I found a way to hide it quicker than before so we don't have that really <laughs> awkward pause by the end. It's not hey. awkward at all. It's wonderful. Yay, here we are. <laughs> Meta, season's greetings to all of you people. It's great to see you all here as always. Moe and I are here Christmas. to welcome you to the bar. Mm. Plan of drinks, plan of festivities, all of the things and that and the yeah. others. All the flames and the flumpiness and mm. uh, the tisms. You know? And I've got my yeah, funky christmas shirt on right now so i'm feeling good you know um, beautiful yeah and wow it's only like what 10 days till christmas or something now it's not not long at all it sort of snuck up on me i've been uh dude time has been moving so weird have you ever... <laughs> you're the weirdest way that I've, I've known time has been moving quickly is i shaved like fully and then I was working on the video, and then I, I checked, and I was like, how is my beard already back? I was like, did I shave yesterday? And it's like, no, it's been a while. I've just been shaving <laughs> editing on stuff. you got, like, a big Rip Van Winkle beard. <laughs> oh, god damn, this video's taking a while. Editing dungeons. I don't recommend it. But no, no. It works out eventually. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's worth it for the end result, I suppose. You know, yeah. we all get to enjoy it anyway. You're just like a broken man lying in the corner, <laughs> like, oh god, don't don't make me do another one. You get a little less broken when the video premieres, and then I break again. It's it's all good. It's a process. Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, well, anyway, well, should we make with the festive cheer and bring some of our guests in? I think we should. All right, making her long-awaited return to the bar. It is baggage claim from the very sunny-looking Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was, we're all going to pretend that we're not jealous right yeah. now. Yeah, close. San Francisco. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> yeah, still California. Close yeah, enough, still yeah. California. Glad to be back, <laughs> and I'm really happy both of you have survived the Doctor Who special, which honestly oh. just felt like a virtual oh. assassination attempt on all of us. Via cringe. It Honestly, was I don't know that experience. I survived it. <laughs> it could be in hell now, I'm not sure. I think uh, when the BBC's own culture editor says that the, the episode is just a delivery mechanism for the message, um, yeah. yeah, you know you're in trouble. So That was so that, surprising. They're seeing it for themselves. So Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's kind of weird that they get to review their own content. Like, oh, yeah. wow, it's amazing. What are the, <laughs> what are the odds? But, We're like, totally yeah, unbiased can... on this, guys. Yeah. Yeah. But if yeah. even they say it sucks, then, yeah, there's definitely a problem there. And, oh, yeah. I feel bad for David Tennant. I feel bad that they brought him back for that just to uh, tarnish his legacy. Yeah. But that haircut yeah. was the real abomination. I mean, that was kind of what he was always like, wasn't it? He always had like, yeah, the, like spiky, spiky hair. Yeah. yeah. Um, it just kept, as, it get, kept getting more and more forward momentum as the episode went on. It, yeah. And it started to look really fake. I don't know. It's like it, like the hair you would get in a, a video game character in a cutscene or something. <laughs> just like doesn't look real. Um, but yeah, as, as Donna pointed out, like that sort of thing is fine when you're like 30 years old. But like when you're when you're in your mid 40s or pushing 50, it's not quite so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's bring our next guest in. Uh, he is making his return actually because he had some technical problems last week, so we weren't really able to bring him on. So he gets a second chance at the bar. It's mm. the movie cynic. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello. and hopefully, hopefully your internet holds up today. Yeah, my goodness. So I, this is actually like try number three. I was supposed to be on for the Marvels. Had to cancel that uh mm. then i was excited to talk about godzilla minus one and had massive technical problems so i got a new microphone a new location let's if if this doesn't work this time i'm not coming on until i get back to yeah. nashville it's just cursed <laughs> at that point no, if this Nashville. doesn't work it's like i'm quitting youtube i'm just done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you should try uploading videos with this internet connection i've been using too what a nightmare yeah i mean to be fair i live in scotland so yeah uh, i know your pain <laughs> 
it's uh, it's a it's a process for sure but uh yeah well hopefully your your internet holds out and it's good to have you back on man so thank yeah, thanks you. man uh and last up it is making his well it's, it's not his debut but it's making his return all the way from australia it is the one and only robot heads welcome back my friends good morning good evening from the correct side of the planet where we have hot christmas yeah <laughs> <laughs> christmas so, barbecue that's the way forward yes but i do love that even we have all our decorations have snow on them so we have like fake snow <laughs> hanging off the house yeah. and it's like 40 degrees outside it's, and snowmen in the front yard so it makes a lot of sense i mean have you even like seen snow in australia is that a thing that even happens we do but it's like um it's more like ice and mm. uh which things like that happens to me you break shoulders when you fall when you're at mm. the snow trying to do snowboarding and you slam onto the hard ice it's not a good thing yeah but it must uh, suck that when in the time that it's actually you know cold and like shorter days in winter time in australia you don't get something as festive as christmas just kind of like because i feel like the most depressing months are january and february because you don't even it's the days are so short and it's so cold but then there's nothing to look forward to at least in december you have you know the whole festive season you guys don't get that during winter. And I'm in Melbourne, so it's a long, depressing winter where nothing mm. happens. And then summer, everything happens. <laughs> Can we do everything? <laughs> Three months Put it everything. all there. Yeah, and then yeah. it's depressing for a good six, seven months. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's life down here. <laughs> to be fair, like in Scotland in the wintertime, it's like that movie 30 Days of Night. You know, you've got to watch out for the vampires because they'll come out sooner or later. <laughs> you know, it's just like... <laughs> We have stumbling wear, like, home from the bar yeah like well it's like if you, you wear like a brightly colored t-shirt you can just like feel all the trees and bushes kind of leaning in towards you trying to get some light coming off you, you know? it's like, help us <laughs> trap souls in there yeah <laughs> anyway well i was gonna say um we had a few things that we were going to cover tonight but uh one of the things that just kind of cropped up um before we really went live was um jonathan majors and his trial that's currently ongoing now there's been a lot of revelations that have come out um in the course of that and one of the big ones was the uh the messages that he's exchanged between uh him and his ex-girlfriends and it, it makes for some interesting stuff like i don't know if um you know chilling is the word for it but um man it gives a bit of an insight into the psychology and i can read a little bit out for you guys just to give you a flavor of um the kind of interactions they they have because i've been hearing really mixed things about this trial and and um how close he is to being exonerated or convicted it seems to be all over the place depending on who you talk to um but the, one of the main ones was uh, text messages um, dating back to September 2022, uh, discussing an incident between Majors and his girlfriend, um, what was it, Grace Jabari, um, ex-girlfriend by this point. Um, he, mm. She had suffered a head injury. Um, we don't exactly know why, but she wanted to go to hospital because she was suffering from recurring pain and unable to sleep, so she wanted to get medical treatment for it. Um, he didn't want it to go though, and quote from him: uh, "I fear, I fear that you have no perspective of what could happen if you go to the hospital. They'll ask you questions, and as I don't think you actually protect us, it could lead to an investigation. Even if you do lie and they suspect something." She responded, "I'll tell the doctor that I bumped my head. If I go, I'm going to give it one more day, uh, but I can't sleep and I need stronger painkillers. That's all." Why would I want to tell them what really happened when it's clear that I want to be with you? Um, um, she, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound great. She also said, um, I will go to the doctor. It, sorry, I will not go to the doctor if you don't feel safe with me doing so. I promise I would never mention you, but I understand your fear. Uh, well, wow. Yeah. In response, he said, last night I considered... Um, ending myself versus coming home and i will probably end myself it's not really con contemplating anymore i'm a monster a horrible man not capable of love i am ending myself soon i've already put things in motion and he wow. just watched his movies yeah <laughs> i mean that's uh that, that if you were a cynical person you could attribute that to emotional manipulation yeah you, you might do say exactly it's a bit what i narcissistic want. Yeah. Could, could, you, 
Could you think of anything worse? If you, if I was in court and they, they just start saying, we're going to start reading out texts to an ex-girlfriend, I'd be just like, hang on, I'm guilty. That's it. Just put me away. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd rather, <laughs> Let's not go through all of discovery, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do not look at my browsing history. The um, drunken texts. Uh, and, oh, yes. No, I'd rather go to jail. Yeah. Uh, there was like, also... I killed everybody. I did it all. I just, just don't. <laughs> The, yeah, there's other. Um, yeah, I can, there's also a, another conversation here that was. Um, it was a not a text conversation. It was audio, and they've got the transcript of it here. It says, um, "Where's the best place to start?" Um, yeah, here we go. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, Majors says, "Do you really love me? Do you really?" She says, "Yes." Major says, then how dare you come home drunk and disturb the peace of our house when we have a plan? She says, I'm sorry. Major says, I would like to get to the point where your friends know what job I'm on and go, I think Grace is going to be out of commission. You get me? Jabbar, she says, uh, yeah, I won't. And he says, no, do you understand that? Because that team, that unit, right? Grace has to be of a certain mindset to support. Coretta St uh, Scott King, do you know who that is? That's Martin Luther King's wife, Michelle Obama, Barack Obama's wife. She says, I know, I shouldn't have gone out, and I'm so sorry. He says, let me just lay it out for you, right? If I am, I'm just going to say this. My temper, my shit, all that. All that said, right? And let's say I'm a great man. A great man. <laughs> I'm doing great <laughs> things, not just for me, but for my culture and my world. This is actually the position I'm in. That's real. I'm not being a dick about it. I didn't ask for it. I've worked, and that's the situation. The woman that means, supports uh, me... means mania, right? Yeah, that's really a great thing for the world. <laughs> uh, the woman that supports me, that I support, the work that needs to be a great woman and make sacrifices the way that man is making for her and for them ultimately. Last night, two nights ago, you did not do that. <laughs> I mean... I, I don't want to use the... I'd break a lot of scripts. Yeah, I, I don't want to throw the term narcissist around willy nilly, but I can't think of a better word to describe him. Right yeah, <laughs> yeah, but the, this sound, this is incredibly manipulative. It's it's awful. Yeah, it really seems <laughs> like that. Like if you don't do what I want, I'm going to end myself. And then yeah. like when she kind of comes back around, just going on these crazy diatribes about how you're a great man, like uh, you know. Um, like all these great civil rights leaders of the 60s and you're going to change the world. Like, yeah. dude, you're an actor in a Marvel movie. You're, you're not you're not on par with them. I'm always trying to tell people I'm great and it never works. So <laughs> yeah. some for some reason they don't believe you when you say that. Not you, but anybody saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I get thrown out in my local pub for like urinating on the floor and they're and I'm yeah. just trying to say to them, like, do you realize how great I am? I'm a great man doing great things. It's like, like, yeah. is in the bar, like listing all of his famous movies, and then you're there like I reviewed TLJ, buddy. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when Tywin Lannister says, you know, sends, uh, sends, uh, who's the, who's that like really irritating, ki like kid king in Joffrey. Game of Thrones? Joffrey, there you mm -hmm. go. He sends Joffrey to bed and he says, you know, a real king doesn't have to say that he's king. Yeah. That's like one yeah. of the most well remembered scenes in all of Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's right before it went to shit, dude. Any man who has to proclaim himself king is no king. It's just. It's no uh, king. The, the, jo Joffrey act, awesome. the Joffrey actor's at the other end of the scale in this story, isn't he? Like, he was just like, oh, acting's not really for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. he's retired. You went back yeah. to school, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, after so, you've played a character like Joffrey, you're going to struggle to break away from it, really. and uh, It's probably going to taint a lot of your subsequent... Well, I think he was just young content. enough to not know for sure what he wanted to do in his life. Yeah. It was a really cool decision to see, to be like, yeah, I mean, because I, he could get more roles after that, for sure. But, yeah. Right. Like, but as for well, Jonathan Majors, I mean, as I understand it, like he's effectively done within Marvel. Um, they don't seem to have much interest in working with him anymore. And th this trial is probably going to go on for a while, isn't it? Like it's, mm. but yeah. it's the sort of thing they can't just delay all their movies while they wait to find out if he's guilty or innocent. Like he's effectively out. Um, and the more of stuff like this that comes out, the worse it looks for him. 
yeah, yeah. I don't know how you defend this. And um, uh, were we talking before that they're thinking about moving on from Kang instead of like recasting the character? Because if it's a multiverse, I, I, why couldn't you yeah. recast him? I think they're talking about moving on from him and, and um, maybe bringing oh. in like Victor Von Doom or something as like the next. We Brad. know now. That was you know, I made a video <clears> saying <throat> that's who it should have been in the first place anyway. Like, yeah, Dr. I mean, we, we, we talked oh, about <laughs> how it's, it's no, terrible anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, they're still going to screw it up, but like, it's no great loss for them that Kang is out. Like, he wasn't a great villain. Um, he he was his launch was bungled, and uh, he's been defeated every time he's appeared. Like, you know, so this is probably a, I hate to say a blessing in disguise, but it's certainly not going to harm them any worse than everything else that's happening right now. They should recast Ezra Miller. <laughs> just going to wreck on the whole universe for that. From one side poison of, uh, to another. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Get, get they Amber Heard in it there to play him. Yeah. <laughs> the trifecta. Right now, I saw a rumor tweet about like how uh, Michael Fassbender considered for um, Doom along with, um, what was it, uh, Maz Mikkelsen or whatever. It's like, do mm. they remember which actors have been in the MCU or do they just not care anymore? They yeah. just care. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mads was so honestly, he was so underutilized as that one. Absolutely, yeah. Villain. It's so underutilized. I think, I think he's been so much a victim of his own success. Like he he played this great villain in um in Casino Royale. Mm, like suddenly he was the hot and Hannibal actor. Yeah. Um which came first? I feel like Casino Royale came I'm pretty first. Sure Casino yeah, Royale Casino came, first. came came first, yeah. Yeah, that led to, to Hannibal and then like but the problem is, like, he just became like the generic stock bad guy that everyone wants to cast in everything mm -hmm. because yeah. good actor, interesting look about him, can play right, like, really slimy, menacing characters, perfect. Um, but ended up in absolute garbage. Yeah, you know, even when he replaced thing... Johnny Depp, you know, didn't he replace Johnny yeah. Depp in the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. he even ended up in in fucking um, Death Stranding. Right. Like, yeah. The, he the did. Hideo Kojima game. Well, well um, and he was in the recent Indiana Jones and still didn't embarrass himself. Oh, God. Why was he oh, that's there? right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he so was like, very shit. forgettable he, in it. Yeah. And and he's he's not the only one. You got um, Giancarlo Esposito or Giancarlo, mm. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce it, but he's got the exact same problem. He does Gus and then he's hired to play bad guys all the time that are exactly the same, no yeah. character. He just turns up and is like, he's just trying to remind you of Gus. That's the only thing he does. Charles Dance yeah. has the exact same problem. They hire him to play authority <laughs> figures, generals and leaders that just turn up and go, go over here and you go there and you go there and then leaves. Typecasting yeah. type casting is absolutely a thing. I mean, did Even it the bad guy yeah. inspector, I, I forget his name, but he was from Inglorious Bastards. Christoph Waltz. Yeah. Another and I feel one, like yeah. they cast, they're trying to, they're trying to be lazy and cast uh, the character so that they don't have to spend time on the writing. And actually build yeah. out a strong character. yeah. Like, just play that guy. Keep just yeah. doing that guy. Yeah. It's like you remember this guy in such other hits <laughs> yeah. as blah blah blah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I think at least Christoph Waltz had Django Unchained. I think that was the smartest move that he could have made. It's like to play a really sympathetic, like positive character in that. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's a bit of a, something to balance it out. A bit of an irony, but correct me if I'm wrong. I believe this happened. So he did. Uh, Inglorious Bastards, which I'm pretty sure like put him on the map. Everyone was like, "Holy shit, this mm -hmm. guy's amazing!" Django Unchained confirmed him. It was like, so he's not a one trick pony, and he can do other characters, whatever. Yeah. And then I think um, Tarantino wanted him uh, for the role that Tim Roth has in Hateful Eight, but Christoph Waltz right. was like, "I will, I will not like just be your actor. I'm gonna go be <laughs> an actor." Sort of thing, and then he goes and does a bunch of shit that I don't remember him for. <laughs> like, like Spectre was a huge mistake, yeah. obviously. It, well, it was when he showed up in um, that Alita Battle Angel again. That I just thought, like, yeah. oh god, he was really underutilized in that. I forgot he was yeah, that's the thing. Like, that movie. It's you don't want to be, I guess, hyper connected to one director, or maybe you do. I don't know, but like, I, I feel like Tarantino is more of a guarantee. You will play a different character every time. You will yeah. be able to, you know do a lot of acting as opposed to like yeah we'll just bring you in you sit there and be menacing it's like okay yeah in fact <laughs> you, you have this possibility of building a good partnership where this director knows where to put you and how to you know how to utilize your strengths in the right type of characters he's held brad pitt's career hmm. like everyone that's true all the films you think about it of him lately are all tarantino yeah that's true yeah I feel like Mads Mikkelsen is kind of a victim of like the, I don't know, the last 10 years with Disney because, I mean, 
like uh, smaller actors would need to sign on. So like, if you look, he was been in what multiple Disney products with Indiana Jones and Star Wars because he was in Rogue One and uh, oh, yeah, yeah and, and Doctor Strange. Oh, Christ, I forgot he was in that. I was going <laughs> to say, yeah. you, are, you are correct that he was in Rogue One, but that's 2016 and all the way up to 2023 for Indiana Jones. It's like, hmm. yeah, I guess because he, he's done a few things between that. Anyone watched Arctic or At Eternity's Gate or Polar? For another round, I liked I him in that, another round. Right. I mean, that was yeah. like, but that's a proper movie where he gets to do acting. Like, it's it's not like a Disney <laughs> yeah. fucking product. Oh no, he was in Chaos Walking. That's the goofy <laughs> film with uh, Daisy Ridley <laughs> oh. and Tom Holland. Oh god, no! <laughs> oh no, Matt, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, he's in a film called Return of the Goat Two. <laughs> well, they're, they're... Oh, it's a short <laughs> film. Okay, that's that sounds like it could be funny. Fucking cinema, right there. <laughs> Peak well, cinema. Someone you mentioned Disney there, like uh, sorry, Daisy Ridley. You uh, someone asked me on Twitter just like today, um, would uh, Daisy Ridley turning down the Ray movie like help or hinder her career? Like, would would people respect her more for just like oh. ducking out of this and say, no, I want to be an actor and do real things? Do and I just thought. Years. Who fucking cares? Because like, what career? Like, her latest movie didn't even break out a million dollars. <laughs> like, yeah, she is not a she is not a, a draw. She is not an actor no. in the normal sense. Like, she's not a star. She's just Let's a person way. who locked out with a role. If I were her friend in real life and she said, like, you know, advise me, should I take the Ray movie role? I'd probably be like, yeah, probably. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it's going to be a decent chunk of money, and it's, it's, maybe you'll get, get a few out, more it, movies after that before you fizzle out, you know? Because it'll of, get you out of the house for like a few weeks, and you know, you'll make some money, and then you can probably retire off of it because I don't think you've got a stellar career as an actor in, in front of you. Well, I like mean, if, yeah, well, it, it, like you know, we talked about Brie Larson before um, in previous streams. Like, if she'd come to me and says, like, should I do Captain Marvel? I said, no. <laughs> just you, you've actually got yeah. a pretty successful career by itself. Just do more things like room, like yeah. things that actually let you act. Do that. You you'll be so much happier and you'll yeah. be much more successful. And she's yeah. she's an adept actress, but yeah. Daisy Ridley is kind of similar similar to Amelia Clark. I feel like Amelia Clark is has such a great personality. She's so charismatic, but she just doesn't have great acting yeah. chops. And she had that one great role that she was kind of perfect for, but beyond that, I don't think she's going to have much of a much of a career, unfortunately. I think the problem with Amelia Clark is people haven't quite found the niche that she works in. Like they keep trying to slot her into action roles, and it's so inappropriate. Bizarre. Yeah, you have the it's same like, result every yeah, fucking Stolo, time. Um, Terminator Genesis, the, mm. the fucking scroll thing, oh, yeah. the secret yep. invasion. Like yeah. she can't, she's not an action star. She can't nope. do that sort of thing. Stop trying no. to make her into this. Like she's, she's a cute, lovely a, lady. Let her. Yeah. Do yeah, cute, like, I don't know, like rom coms, maybe like something like light and fun. Like yeah, she's and rom coms just she's don't just have lights the, anymore. Yeah. You know, action star. Because I was going to say, you go to Daisy Ridley's IMDb, and it's like best known for Force Awakens, Last Jedi, Rise of Skywalker, Murder on the Orient Express. Like, that's never going to change, is it? <laughs> nope. It's going to be them for a whole <laughs> career. But the thing is, you look at her stuff, and you're like, The Marsh King's <clears throat> Daughter. I've never heard of that. Sometimes I think about dying. It's like, never heard of that. Zoe Trope. These are all like movies that possibly look indie. So it looks like she's trying. It's just <laughs> not working. Bless her if she's trying. Bless like, it, I look at, hot. I, I mean, I look at guys like um, you know Adam Driver. He's having a lot of success mm -hmm. outside of yeah. Star Wars. Like he's doing, he's in Ferrari, which is about to come out. And like, I'm kind of interested to see his performance there. Um, me too. He's um, he does nothing but impress me in everything Os I ever Oscar see. Oscar Isaac again, a really good actor. He, yes. To be fair, he was kind of successful before he did Star Wars, but like this, you know, it's kind of helped him ultimately. Like he's still doing lots of really good stuff. Um, haven't heard a huge amount from John Boyega recently, but um Which is sad. You, He's I like him. I like him a lot. I think his acting is still I, I don't think it's anything that special, but he's just very charismatic and super yeah. underutilized. I was gonna watch it, but I forgot I just forgot it was on. He was just in there in a Netflix film, wasn't he? With, like um, Clone Tyrone, you talking about that? Yes. Has anyone mm. watched that? No. No, is, not yet. Is it good? <laughs> not the draw card, but yeah, I did mean I was going to watch that. That's the only thing I know he's been in lately. Um, they need to take he's in the Woman like... King too. After oh, all yeah. that movie, right? Oh yeah. I have not. Oh, yeah. Oh, that that, that, that classic. 
Michael Caine was giving advice to someone once. I can't remember who, but he said, just do them all. He said they'll only remember the good ones. And <laughs> he looked through Michael Caine's career and he did some shocking films. And it's true, you know, like, yeah, just Definitely take true. Yeah, it's true for the people who are in really good stuff. Uh, but, like, there's some people, I think, because, you know, like, Christopher Lee, he was in countless bad things, but mm. who cares, right? Like, nobody yeah. at all. But then yeah. there are some actors who are almost known for turning up in bad things. Um, it, it's it's all right advice Nick if you're Cage. getting like yeah I'd say Nick Cage <laughs> yeah. yeah Robert uh, De Niro to some extent like yeah it's complicated all right you do have to pick and choose somewhat but I think I think about some my actors, father was the recent one too yeah some actors just want to do as much as they can especially when they get older as well because they're just like yeah fuck it let's go because Christopher Lee's up there but he's he's not even uh, close to like the top scorer for isn't like is it Eric Roberts has one of the highest amount of credits. For uh, full time films, I'll check. Uh, I was going to say Christopher Walken's a good example of this. Like, apparently, <laughs> like as I, I read an interview with him, and he tries to do as many movies as he possibly can. Like every script that comes across his desk, if he can fit it into the schedule, he'll do it. I love really? that. He awesome. just wants to be in movies. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, Christopher Walken and Keanu Reeves are two actors where, like, they could do that and make a bad movie and not tarnish their legacy at all. Um. Yeah. I, th I think there's I think a I level of that. yeah. He does just doesn't care, I guess. And, yeah. yeah. Well, Eric Roberts has been in over seven hundred productions. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, I was actually good lord. You, <laughs> you ruined it. I was gonna set it up. I was gonna be like, okay, so oh, Christopher sorry, Lee, sorry, sorry. Christopher Lee was in two hundred and eighty-eight, <laughs> right? With one upcoming, I guess he, he's recorded uh, voice for stuff that hasn't come out yet. But that's insane. Christopher Lee, who's known for being in shit tons of stuff, being two eight eight. Christopher Walken, who, as you just established, is trying to be in loads of stuff. He's only got 144. Uh, I say only. And then, yes, Eric Roberts' previous work is 682 actor credits with 86 coming up. Oh, good Jesus. lord. And I, the last time I saw him in anything that I can remember was like one of the Dark Knight movies. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy that he's just in that. Well. It must be just low budget, like director streaming stuff. Um, he's also in um, The Expendables. Runway Train. Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, Runaway Train was great. That was like a really mm. early role for him. I, I really like that movie. Uh, but he must White drive from set to set, like, and do like a ten minute <clears throat> scene and go to the next set. Like, how do you even fit that amount of films in? Do you think it's like financial? Like, he needs the money, or is it just like I really just like want to keep working? I think, yeah, I think he probably just loves the process. I guess, especially the sh the shorter the project time, you know. Like, can, can is this a movie I can do in two days? They're like, yeah. <laughs> if you if you do one take for everything, it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, I was when we mentioned Adam Driver there as well. Like, there was one thing that stuck out for me recently. He did an interview with um, Chris Wallace, like uh, one of the sort of oh. talk show guys um, who interviewed him about, and like the conversation turned to like how Adam Driver looks, and this just felt really uncomfortable. <laughs> I wish I had I the clip that. to hand. But it was basically like, you don't look like a conventional movie star, do you? And like Adam Driver just tried to deflect it. And he's like, yeah, I guess I guess not. But, you know, it's been fine for me. And you think that would be fine. They just move on. But no, Chris just decided he was going to keep going in on this one. It's like, so how's that affected your career? How's that affected your self-image? What do you think of yourself when you look in the mirror? How does it feel to be ugly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like so you're so... ugly. Do you know that? Are you aware? <laughs> I just feel we so need to know you're aware. Guy. People avoid you because of your ugliness. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah. You have yeah. literally destroyed more mirrors than, <laughs> than a sledgehammer. So it's funny because because of Adam Driver as well as Timothy Chalamet on TikTok. This was a couple of years ago, two three years ago. There was this whole debate about the difference between ugly hot and hot ugly. And so there was this one woman who came up with that concept and she explained it that Adam Driver is ugly hot. Whereas I, I forget what example like she used was like hot, have. ugly. Yeah. What's that? It's like that conversation like from men have. It's just it, hot the, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> this, well, this was a conversation like dated back to like the office where it's like yeah, they were debating yeah. for a whole episode is Hillary Swank hot or not? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really, like, really complex problem to try and solve. <laughs> yeah. But like, right. yeah, with Adam Driver, like, I don't know. He seems like a really cool guy. Like, he's, I, I don't think I've ever seen an interview where he didn't come off as pretty chill and just like mm -hmm. quite likable. And yeah, it's kind of a shit thing to pick on him for. 
It is. Uh, and he's doing okay. Even when he was buffed in Last Jedi and, you know, had to turn around with the shirt off, he couldn't even get away with that. That just became a meme and people laughing. <laughs> it didn't yeah. look especially bad or anything. It just... But just, there's the proportions whole corner were just slightly of the off internet. Me. <laughs> but there's a whole corner of the internet that loves him, like the women that just are obsessed with him. And it's the, his. I think it's specifically around his energy. There's an obsession over his hands, by the way, because of how large <laughs> his hands are. I'm not kidding. I'm totally serious. Okay. There is so much female simping happening over Adam Driver, and I can I see it. I as a woman, I I totally get it. I mean, does it just come down to, um, yeah, the charisma yeah. of a person rather than like their actual attractiveness? Because I, I'm, I would posit to you, I suppose that there's plenty of good-looking guys who don't really have much personality and they they don't have much charisma, and so they're not attractive in the sense. But they should be just by how they look. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, but it's look at the classic like Steve McQueen. If you actually look at Steve McQueen's face, that's a rough <laughs> face, you know. Yeah. And He's lived a life. He's yeah. like, he's women seen things. And he loved women. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, a lot of those guys got pretty but rough it's heads. The energy. But, yeah, yeah. The charisma. It's the stands, everything. There's, yeah. Steve McQueen, Paul Newman. Yeah. It's an interesting, yeah. Interesting thing to consider. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did anyone see 65? Or was I did. One? I did. I'm, I'm afraid I saw it. Yeah. It's so bad. <laughs> I was told to avoid it. This feels should, like a movie yeah. that should have come out in like 1995 when like the mania for dinosaurs was at its peak. You know, we had Jurassic Park and it's like, oh, we can we can animate dinosaurs now. It's going to look really cool. Like now it just feels like really weird and dated and silly. They were I'm really proud that. of themselves for being like 65 million, million. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, okay. I got it. He has to I escape the trailer. Asteroid. I think Adam Driver even mentioned that he likes to take these big projects on so that then it ends up financing his his true love which are the smaller projects where he doesn't get paid too much mm. he well, definitely yeah. doesn't look yeah. like he's ever phoning it in like even watching yeah. that every scene mm -hmm. he's he's acting like he's doing the job you know he's come to work that day you never get the feeling that he just gives up you know i'm sure sometimes he wants to give up but yeah he, he's always trying to get the job done yeah i have to assume I, I that's the kind of act you want on a project who will just give you everything you need uh, no mm. matter how shit everything is, <laughs> well, I think that there's so much. I got so much respect for actors like that who just, you know, even if they're in a shit production, they still give it their all. And I think yeah. that's such professionalism because, like, yeah, the the instinct would be to think I'm better than this. I don't need this job. Uh, I'm just going to phone it in and get my paycheck and fuck off. Mm. Um, and for guys to just say, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it 100 percent no matter what. Oh, that's that's pretty <clears> admirable. <throat> um, but to, when when we're talking about actors who, you know, they take big profile roles um, to make the, the 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 payday basically to pay for like smaller, more interesting projects, like Moller, you and I talked to Jason Fleming. We did an interview on like Lance's yeah. channel, and he he said much the same thing. Like he would take on um, big budget Hollywood productions that maybe didn't have a huge amount of artistic merit to them. Um, but it allowed him to like then take on much more interesting, smaller, low budget stuff, um, and and have a lot of fun with that. And I thought that's a that's a pretty good balance to have. It's probably a good position to be in as an actor, where you can flip between these high profile and and indie projects. It's yeah, good to I'm... see um, passion like that for the craft. And it comes through because yeah, there's a lot of actors who when they turn up, you don't even remember they were in the film. But then there are people like Adam Driver, who, as far as I'm concerned, his acting is the reason Kylo Ren had like any respect and fandom. It's got mm -hmm. nothing to do with the writing. It's all it's all his efforts to try and bring the character to life. Well, he um, he talked about this just uh, recently, where he said that the original plan for Kylo Ren was that he would start out kind of weak and conflicted and uh, not sure of his place in the world and become more and more hardcore and committed to the dark side. And he would become an absolutely terrifying figure by the end. It was supposed to be the inverse of Darth Vader's arc in the original trilogy. Instead, we got what we got. Which Whatever was that was. Mess. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was just a mess of, of different ideas. <laughs> and I just thought, how, how pissed off must he have been? Like, he, he signed up for this thing being sold like a potentially interesting character arc that would let him do lots of cool things as a villain. And instead, he just got this absolute disaster of a character that 
meant nothing and stood for nothing. Mm. Um, yeah, that, John that, that, must have some good conversations about what yeah. went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that moment where, where he kissed Ray. Ugh. It's like, what the oh my fuck God. even is this? Yeah, that felt so shoehorned. It was just, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it should there should be like a support group for like John John Boyega for Adam Driver and Amelia Clark for what happened, you know, with their characters. Yeah, like the, it's like a PTSD group or something, yeah. like coping with like Hollywood related trauma. <laughs> Good. We failed yeah, you, I'm sorry. How to promote these films. Like he never even his promotion of those films just seems so from the actor's point of view. You know, he never oversold it. He never sort of sucked up JJ's ass or anything. It was just like, this was the job. This is what I did. And then these type of actors just walk on to the next film. You don't, they, they don't carry any of that baggage with them. Unlike, you know, Snow White actresses and people like that that just carry the baggage through their whole life with them. Oh, we'll get to that yeah. in a second. Don't you worry. <laughs> yeah. Don't you worry, Robot. <laughs> There's plenty to be said about about that, but just to add to what you're saying that, yeah, that Adam Driver is one of the few people working today that I, it actually feels genuine when he speaks. You know, he, he hasn't bought into his own hype. Yeah. I did like I'm gonna go. Promoting. It must have been the last film, and he called The Last Jedi the second one. He couldn't think of, he couldn't even remember the name <laughs> of the <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, the just one. Ca- a cocaine fueled blur for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's well, like, I was gonna. Sorry, I was gonna talk yeah. a little bit about this actually. Um, since you brought it up, as we all know, uh, Snow White is a film that Disney are making, and it hasn't exactly been a success story. Um, that's putting it mildly, mostly due to Rachel. Whatever Zegler. do you mean? I know. Um, yeah, mostly due to Rachel Ziegler and her interesting comments that she's made in various interviews over the past several months. And wow, like I don't think I've ever seen such a, a thermonuclear bad reaction to this, um, to the point where Disney have pulled the movie and uh, delayed it by an entire year while they desperately do reshoots. Um, and wow, I think we were all impressed by those CGI dwarves that we saw. They were very convincing, definitely weren't added in um, as a desperate yeah. measure. Um, but anyway, um, she recently did an interview for Variety, and it was one of those actor-on-actor actor interviews with Halle Bailey, and they talked a little bit about uh, their experiences playing Disney princesses, and Rachel shared her thoughts once again on Snow White. And I'm going to give you a video that will give you a little comparison, and I'm sorry to have to subject you to some of Rachel Zegler's greatest hits, Um but you can see a little bit of it and then you can see what she's like now in her most recent interview and see if there's a, a difference in tone, shall we? I mean, you know, the, the original cartoon came out in 1937 yeah. and very evidently so. <laughs> um, there is a big focus on her love story um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird, weird. I just mean that it's no longer 1937 and we absolutely wrote a Snow White that she's is... not going to be yeah. saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. All of Andrew's scenes could get cut. Who knows? It's Hollywood, baby. But <laughs> The cartoon was made 85 years ago and therefore it's extremely dated when it comes to the ideas of women being in roles of power. Several months later. The cartoon is so beloved. It's like a monumental moment in film history. Yeah. It was like the first feature length <laughs> cartoon <laughs> movie to the point where it, it won honorary Oscars and yeah. all of these amazing things that, that happened for that film are the reason that you and I really get to sit here today because yes. it made... No. She just what can't could possibly have happened? I know. She just can't say enough good things about Snow White now. Like, hmm. if I was a cynical man, I'd say that someone from the Disney PR team has been coaching her for the past few weeks. They should have been re-educated. <laughs> yeah. Re-education camp. Well, if, you pause it very, if you pause it very carefully and enhance, you can actually see the Disney executive holding a gun to her head, just slightly <laughs> off screen, just slightly out of shot. Um, they should have put above the notes, though, please read in your own voice. Like, it's like she's actually reading from the notes that they gave her and didn't sort of try and work it in naturally. It was the first film for Academy Award for animation. Like, it's all just she's trying to remember she's the facts. Like, 
peeking down at her notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was released in uh, 1937. Is that right? A yeah, great sure. year oh, for right. movie making for Disney. We would not be here if it weren't for Disney. I am most grateful to Disney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a great deal of respect for this movie and everything that it represents. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, it was it was a funny little bit of uh, PR spin, I guess. Um, and I don't think it convinced too many people because I said this in the, the video that I made just recently. Um, you know how you have that concept of guilt by association? I think what they are trying for here is uh, virtue by association. So they paired her up with Halle Bailey, uh, who I, on the surface seems to be in a similar position to Rachel Zegler, a, a woman of um, diverse background um, who was cast into a role. Um, that was played, you know, it was a white character originally um, and took a bit of heat for it. Um, the difference being, though, Halle Bailey took a little bit of heat initially, but she didn't respond to it. And she just kind of got on with the job of being Ariel. And nobody really had a problem with her as a person. They had a problem with her casting. And eventually that just kind of subsided and uh, the movie came out. Now, that's one way of doing it. Then there's the Rachel Zegler way where, yeah, again, people had issues with her casting because, again, Snow White was a, a white character initially and they race swapped her. Um, but the real backlash came once all those interviews came to light and people got to see how disrespectful she was to the original movie, how she even laughed at one of her co-stars potentially getting written out of the film altogether like that was funny um, and just came across as generally a pretty unpleasant person. And again, I don't want to like attribute motive here because who knows, like maybe maybe she was told to say all this stuff. But either way, it presents an image of a person who's very entitled, very arrogant, very like high on, on their, the smell of their own farts uh, and just feels like they can they can throw out whatever they want to say. Um, and it didn't go down very well. And that's clearly been a, a real shift since then. Yeah. And. You know, the whole interview is such, it's just dripping in insincerity. And that's, I, I had to do a little ca palate cleanser just after watching this interview, just to kind of get a sense of, of reality. I watched instead um, uh, the um, sit down, actors on actors sit down with uh, Margot Robbie and, um, why am I spacing? Oppenheimer's name. I'm so sorry. I'm spacing on his name. Murphy. Name. There you go. Um, and there the two of them are speaking very sincerely to each other asking each other questions about methods around acting producing direction all of this stuff and here you have these two you know 20 something very they're very young actresses and every single part of that interview is just intensely propping each other up oh you dealt with that so beautifully that was so graceful you just had my heart and it was incredible to see did you see that and and were you just in tears it was just it's so much <laughs> yeah. artifice just infused into the conversation and you know you can see where Halle Halle Bailey is a little different she's she was attributing a lot of her success to outside forces. She was attributing it. She was, she was showing a lot of genuine gratitude. She was even, you know, thanking God and, and her family's role in helping her through all this. And with um, Rachel Zegler, she, you know, she says at one point that, you know, women get so criticized. I think either Hallie said that or she said that, that women get so hugely criticized, which, you know, to bring our gender into everything is, is just so frustrating is that something bad happens to you and you say, oh, it's well, it's because I'm a woman. And I, I've always detested that kind of reasoning behind anything, but that's quite common these days. But then she says, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to say what they're going to say. They're going to be critical. They're going to be uh, negative. Um, and here I am promoting a movie. And then Halle Berry goes, you know, she does like a little snap thing to, to again, to prop her up further. And so at the end of the day, even on this, what you could call an apology tour, her end answer out of this is that you're a hater. I'm, look at me, I'm promoting a movie, you know? And for that, she, and that's that moment that the mask really slips where she shows how she really feels about this. But leading up to it, um, she has the same face. You can see the same face, which is, you know, eyebrows up, some 
it's like her eyes are almost concerned and tearful and she looks vulnerable for the whole thing. She has that same approach of just vulnerability. And then for that one second, you see how she really thinks about it, which is, Hey, I'm a movie star. Yeah. yeah. But I think as She's well, been... like it, it's, it's not like, um, yeah, you were just promoting a movie and then suddenly you're getting all this unwarranted um, criticism. It's like you were promoting it uh, as an asshole. And you came across as an asshole, and that's why people have a problem with you. And it's, it's a this um, this washing your hands of all responsibility, and it kind of goes back to what I said before: of we're going to create this false equivalency by putting Rachel Zegler next to um, Halle Bailey, um, and and try to pretend that they're the same. They were criticized for the exact same reasons, purely because they're diverse actresses playing um, white characters, like. Uh, and that's the only reason. And it's not. Rachel Zegler was criticized because she came across really badly on a personal level. Halle Bailey was criticized for her casting, but not as a person. And yeah. that is very, very different. But like I say, they're trying to create this uh, this um, fallacy of like virtue by association. Like, well, if we just put them together, people like Halle Bailey, they'll probably also end up liking Rachel Zegger because they're just going to see them as the same person or the same, uh, a person in the same situation. And same um, societal fight too, right? It's, it's it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it's just like, it would have been, it would have been so much more effective if she had just made a video in her fucking living room and said, Hey, you know what? I, I was caught on the red carpet and I got a little bit too caught up in the whole enthusiasm of the moment. And I said some really dumb stuff and I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Uh, and this, you know, I just want to now focus on doing the best job I can. You yeah. have to like acknowledge that you screwed up. And if you do that and you apologize for it, 95% of people are, are going to accept that because it's really it's hard. Really to... Yeah. It's, it well, it's hard to stay mad at someone who's genuinely sorry. And like, you know, acknowledges that they did something wrong and they want to do better. Okay. You know, it's a pretty hard hearted person who's going to still be mad at them and still hate them. Um, but instead of that, it's like, no, we're just going to subtly change direction here and deflect the blame onto other people and pretend mm -hmm. that I did nothing wrong. And I just yeah. thought you missed an opportunity there. You really did. When there's an apology, like, you know, if you're um, not moving forward, you're participating in cancel culture. But when it comes to Rachel Zegler, like even earlier this year, she was complaining about, um, well, not complaining, but she was poo-pooing the Shazam 2 movie. And it wasn't even like a long length of time between the release of the movie when she was uh, basically shitting on it and talking about how she, you know, only took it for the money. Um, and that was like back in like March when that movie came out. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's that's not the first time you've ever heard an actor say they took a movie for money or anything but um this is like a <laughs> this is a pattern and uh she did it like you know like the week or two to distance herself from the movie once it came out because it bombed um so yeah this is like nothing new for Zegler. and all at the same time like if someone's apologetic too if their work is really great like if you're just making great product if you're making a great movie if you're doing a great job um that also shuts a lot of people up um, but like nothing she's done this year has actually been like really standouty anyway. So it's, um, you know, an entitlement coming from someone who's not doing anything particular to earn it either. Well, I think a lot of people have been pointing to like, uh, the new hunger games movie that she's in and saying, ha, see, that's a success. And nobody's and talking about made that. For no money. Yeah. Well, and it's like, uh, in your face haters and it's like, wait a minute, this movie cost a hundred million to make. Uh, it's another 50, 60 million at least for marketing. Uh, when you factor in the distribution costs, like the 50% that the distributors take, this is going to have to make at least 300 million, at least 300 million just to break even. And it's currently sitting at 260 million, uh, according to Box Office Mojo. Um, and it's been out for a month already. This movie is not right. going to break even. It's right, not and the cope make money. is that it's like ranking number one, but uh, or it had, but like, what's the point of being number one anyway if you're only making, you know, whatever, like twenty nine, fourteen million dollars? If if you're number um, one and your competition is like the the Marvels, or, or, right? That's not <laughs> that impressive. You know, it's like you're the smartest kid on the short bus. So like, okay, great. Well, 
Dude, isn't it crazy <laughs> if uh, Dune came out on time? The the, the Marvels would have made even mm. less money in that time. Mm, yeah, yeah, because yep. it wouldn't even <laughs> have gotten those IMAX screens. No. Towards the end, did we not do a check and it was like averaging about like sixty five dollars per theater or something? Oh, <laughs> absolutely, That's just it. absolutely absurd. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why it's such a great film. It's so good. I mean, yeah. I went on opening day and um, it was the theater was eighty percent empty. I love the idea you, know. you turn up and they're like, oh, big fan. You go, no, 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 reviewer. And they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, YouTuber looking for more content. <laughs> yeah. It's like, are you a big fan? It's like, YouTuber. It's like, right, right, yeah. Yeah. Next just, one, yeah. I'm just literally here so I can claim this as a business expense. Okay, I'm going yeah, to yeah. get like five points while I'm here. <laughs> They'll make way more money from that than they would from the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with, the, with with this whole like apology tour, I, I just don't think it's gonna change too many people's minds. And yeah, man, this this movie is just cursed. Like, I don't know if their hope is if we leave it an entire year and we don't have any real press around it, maybe people will just forget about all this stuff that went on. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, what that's probably the hope. Are the CGI dwarves, was that just for a promotional poster or are they gonna replace the tall? Real dwarves. I think. Which one are they going with? You know, there's all the set photos with the tall. Yeah, mixed... it is both now, right? The, the 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 people ones. They're not even the dwarves. They're just some other thing that's going to be happening in the film or whatever. <sighs> well, no, are they not trying to argue that they were just stand-ins? So I like, don't. The real dwarves are going to be CGI'd over them or something. That makes sense to have. I don't know. I, don't, I guess we might have seen. By the way, when you said, what about the CGI dwarves? I thought you meant like you were joking, like they have captured dwarves that work on the CG for all the models. <laughs> it's like, why are they capturing dwarves? <laughs> <laughs> Strange. But we you just start to set up a charity to like combat this. Like, stop capturing dwarves. <laughs> Hashtag rescue the CGI dwarves. Every week, dozens of dwarves are captured for nefarious purposes by Disney. <laughs> And they they can't need your them. help. They'd be happy. Dwarves just naturally are very good at dude, making special <laughs> yeah. effects. <That's> just... <laughs> yeah. It's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I think, with the dwarves, but this for special effects. Ah, oh, jeez. Yeah, um, speaking of... They, do uh... they don't eat much. <laughs> you can pay them off as much. <laughs> <laughs> Would wardrobe cost less for them as well? Because they use up less material. Yeah. Right Potentially. They only need half a trailer each. So, <laughs> if we had a dwarf on the panel right now, it would be like, I'm very offended, but yes. <laughs> we can stack the trails on top of each other. They don't need that height room. <laughs> no, but I think um, as well, you know that, that image that we saw that was um, very quickly released uh, of Rachel Zegler surrounded by the, the CGI dwarves. Obviously, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, some of them seem to be like looming over her, but they were like standing on benches or chairs or something behind her, so that they got like a framing shot. Um, I just think it's interesting that we never got to see any of that in in motion. It literally was just one image, and that was all we got. And it was round about the same time that this whole backlash was reaching its peak, uh, and people were just mocking every aspect of this film. It's like they they said, "Hey." Look, it's actually got dwarves in it after all. Don't don't worry. And then you know we're just conveniently delaying the film by an entire year for unrelated reasons. And <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. The um, funniest is when the dwarf actors came out, like having a go at Disney. Like, yeah, every turn they make, they just crash into a wall. You know, it's like sideshow Bob with the uh, the rakes <laughs> hit him in the face. It's like, well, you know, we can't, we can't <laughs> use the come out. It's like, Why can't we get jobs? <laughs> Yeah, Disney, yeah, like, well, I thought you people would be happy. And the dwarves are like, what? <laughs> like, what? Well, it's like, it's, it's uh, like Gary said, like, if you play social justice games, then you win social justice prizes. And in this case, the prizes mm -hmm. are you're going to offend someone. Like, no someone, what. like one side, no yeah, what. one side is always going to be offended by what you've done uh, because you've chosen to play that game. And, you know, I, I think somehow through all of this, Peter Dinklage has made himself one of the most hated dwarves in Hollywood. Um, Where's he been lately? Has he been in anything? <sighs> I think that? Cyrano. Like, he was did, in. A, he was in a period yeah. drama thing. Yeah, playing Cyr Cyrano de Bergerac. I think is how you say it. Mm. Got a little too big for his boots remember, in that one. Remember, I think. he was in Pixels. 
He I was. That. Yeah. Well, I don't remember that. I, I always, I always be grateful to him for his role in Elf. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, he was in Transformers: Rise of the Beast. More time. <laughs> Wait, is he not in? Um, he's in the New Hunger Games movie, isn't he? Or am uh, I losing yeah. my mind here? Yeah, he's Dean Caster High Bottom. Oh yeah, yeah, so High Bottom. I see All what right. they did well, there. There you go. That's where he is, I guess. Great name, but he's the one who talked out, talked against uh, Willy Wonka films having dwarves, right? Isn't he the one who prevented that with his statements? So he's the reason Hugh Grant is in Willy Wonka. Okay, yep. Hugh Grant is very ap unhappy about that. He's been complaining left and right about that role for some reason. Well, like well, the, just like, embarrassing. Or? No, yeah, just he, having to like CGI green screen. I think, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So people Very are kind unhappy. of irritated. Yeah, irritated with him. It's like, hey, like, why are you just complaining about this big role you have? I shouldn't say big, small role. Uh, well, here's a good <laughs> question, actually. Um, yeah. I, this genuinely stumped me, actually. Has any of the Game of Thrones actors had good careers after the show? You can argue Peter Dinklage's career is not bad. Um, you know, I'm looking at the roles now. It's like, he's, he's, he's okay. I mean, being in the Hunger Games... It's not like it's going to be a great film or anything, but it's probably, you know, relatively high profile, I guess. That's how you judge it, yeah. I, I assume. You had just the word high, didn't you, Mauler? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you monster. <laughs> you got me. Um, but yeah, like, are we going by how many roles they get or how big the uh, the budgets are or how much we remember these roles? I, I guess, like, one, the, the budget, and two, like, the critical reception of it. Hmm. Right. Because I, oh, I know they like they've tried to launch like guys like Kit Harrington and stuff, and like he was in Pompeii, and that was a disaster. And you know, um, Kit Nicole... Harrington. Speaking Pompeii of what was we were talking, what we were talking no. about earlier about about that charisma, Kit Harrington just doesn't have it. He he plays like the yeah. quiet brewing mm. character quite well, but even when you know the whole reason, even like his Jon Snow and uh, Daenerys just didn't work out. It's like they had like no chemistry. There was just no energy between the two of them. And I think that was primarily because of Kit Harrington's charisma. Probably because the two actors yeah. as well were thinking, what the fuck are we doing? Like, why, why have they tried to mash our characters together? <laughs> You're my aunt. I don't want it. Dramatic queen. success from comparison to their role on Game of Thrones to what they are now is probably Pedro Pascal. Hmm. Yeah. He's had a great career. And, uh, and he can't I, I hate... Game of Thrones is one of the things that helped him move forward because well, people love that and Thrones. Narcos. I think Narcos yeah. probably Narcos. launched him, and Game of Thrones probably cemented it. But um, some people say uh, Sean Bean. It's like Sean Bean's career was hyper solid Sean before Bean... Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah. This dude was in fucking Lord of the Rings and Sharp and Goldeneye. Yeah. Like, yeah, he was doing fine. Yeah, I, th I think I'm in that position. Like probably with a lot of people where I'm getting a little bit sick of seeing Pedro Pascal getting cast in fucking everything. <laughs> well, if he's a, if he is a draw, I guess. I don't know. Is he? I think he was a bad choice for Joel. I, I, I don't think he looks like him. He doesn't embody like the, the, the Joel personality that I remember from the first game. Maybe the second game, he's more like him there. Um, he can't do the accent to save his life. No, um, that's true. Yeah, there was some yesterday they were talking about putting him in. I'm trying to fix and remember what it was. Yeah, what is the latest thing he's been cast in? Oh, you're talking about because yeah, that's on the oh, I don't know. Oh, I could chat will probably just... help us out on this one. Someone put him in a um Indiana Jones post. It might have been just that. I was thinking of it might have been a real story. Jesus just Christ, another... is he in Gladiator 2? He's been cast for that, and Fantastic oh, Four, of course. Reed Richards is a rumor, Reed Richards, but, yeah. yeah. That was it. He's got... Uh, yeah, he's everywhere. <laughs> and I'm just like... He's not that good. Like, he, he's a solid actor, but then... Like, he's... I don't really I mean, see him I as mean, a, I don't really see him as an action star, so, like, he doesn't really suit action-y roles like that, and... I wonder if part of the problem is we've seen way too much of him not being very good now. We've, we've got, like... Because Oberyn Martell was great. Hmm. And it's like... Okay, yeah. You, got. you watched him in all of Mandalorian. He's, I mean, almost deliberately like people call it stoic. I would just call it it's basically like one Fucking one note, in. you know? Yeah, actually, might very well be phoned in as far as we're aware. But uh, the 
yeah, it's like he's tearing up a book above it. But then Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, I thought he was really good in that. Yeah, I liked him in that. But that's like a Ooh. movie where, it, I don't know, it's almost like he's not trying to play um, an action star or anything. He's a guy who's just like a, just having fun. Like he's a bit of a sycophant towards Nick Cage and like he's, you know, he's not a hero and he just gets to enjoy himself. And like clearly Pascal was really into the role and he played it great. So no criticisms of him there. In Wonder Woman, that's the... I couldn't stand him. Oh, that was just all. Oh, I mean, yeah, the that script was, that was awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That movie had a lot of problems. Yeah, that was what? the whole movie. I think when we can pick on the whole thing. Yeah, I think even getting rid of his beard for that was such a mistake because he looks he looks so much better with the beard. It was just it was just all wrong. I think he's like trying to cast an obviously Hispanic actor like and give him like blonde hair and stuff. It just looks a bit <laughs> silly. And yeah, he he was just the script gave him nothing to work with, and so all he could do was overact and just be like a pantomime villain. And I found him. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't work. Okay, it was very hammy. In that film, though. Like Wonder Woman. Oh, sorry? Yeah, I found him infinitely more interesting than most people in that film. Like, it felt like nobody gave a shit. Kristen Wiig was in that. She was the bad guy, right? She was Cheetah. Yeah. Yeah, she was the cat. Yeah, the cat lady. Good God, that was a terrible. That film was decision. crazy. Why did they make that? Like, yeah. I don't know. Well, like, I say one this is if it, it did have great consequences. It basically destroyed Patty Jenkins' career. Yeah. That film. It uh, it was predicated on the idea that Gal Gadot can actually act, and that was a mistake. <laughs> in retrospect, <laughs> I had to do a bit of convincing of that point back then. I think uh, after the you first didn't have Woman, to you didn't I, have I, to convince I, me. Not you. I I'm pretty sure if you go back to the EFAP on it, uh, we had to make the case to Gary and some other people that like she's a shit actress, and they're like she's okay if you don't give her any lines. <laughs> 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 I, yeah. I think the first Wonder Woman worked really well because Gal Gadot was basically playing Gal Gadot in that film. Like she didn't have to act outside of her own personality, and so it didn't re really ask too much of her. But with this this second film, she really had to emote. Like she was going to have to do some serious heavy lifting to sell this one, and she just doesn't have it. She doesn't have you know, that range. You want to make for an interesting video talking about what. Uh, Wonder Woman 184 did to Patty Jenkins what Rise of Skywalker did to J.J. Abrams and uh, what Thor Love and Thunder's done to Taika Waititi. Not mm -hmm. just in career opportunities, but their reputations as directors as well. Mm. I don't know, like, Taika Waititi just seems emboldened by it. Like, Well, yeah, but that's the, 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 I was going to say, that's the interesting thing, right? Patty Jenkins basically lost all of her career opportunities slash gave up. Uh, JJ's disappeared. No one knows what the hell he's even doing anymore. And then uh, Taika, he's just going on and making more stuff. But that he's gone now from being someone who, as far as I remember, I don't know if, how you guys feel, but rewind about four years or so, and people were like, "Yeah, Taika's awesome. Yeah, we'll check him out on this." Yeah. Now everyone's yeah. like, "Keep him away from everything, please." Yeah. <laughs> the JJ so, uh, one, different results. JJ was like yeah. juggling I... along to yeah. silence. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, he's somehow managing. I mean, whoever made Rise of Skywalker deserves to crawl into a little hole and uh, leave yeah, as yeah. well. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yeah. We're all grateful for the silence. <laughs> it's a funny film. I'll give you that. I mean... Somehow. I, I Honestly, I, th I don't think I've seen it since the year it came out. Like, I've never watched it again all the way through because <laughs> I just can't bring myself <laughs> to do it. wacky film. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, what would, I, I guess if you had to pick, right, what do you consider the worst movie? TLJ or Rise of Skywalker? Oh, we've, we, we've had this conversation so many times that I think you, sh you should include TFA. I think it's fair to pick any of the three. They're, yeah, they're all okay, catastrophic. I'll throw that in there. Sure. Um, I mean, I'm inclined, knee jerk reaction to go for TLJ, naturally. But uh, honestly, like, I, I feel like I could make a really strong argument for any of the three. The, the Rise of Skywalker mm. is a worse film. It's not. It's not even a proper film. It's just. It's bizarre that movie where T. I, obviously, I don't like the Last Jedi, and it's. I've talked about that a lot. But it's. It, it. It looks like someone that made a film that didn't like Star Wars, where the last one just looks like mm. someone that doesn't know how to make films. Like, oh yeah, I would, yeah, I would definitely say the Rise of Skywalker. I, I think. Film. I think the only thing that. Uh, not redeems it, but like um, perhaps like lifts it up slightly in my estimation is 
I can see what JJ was trying to do with Rise of Skywalker, with with so many of the stupid plot points and the throwaway lines and like the the weird events. It's like I can see how you're trying to correct the mistakes of TLJ. I can see your how you're trying to like rebuild something out of the rubble that Ryan Johnson left you. Uh, what you've produced is still absolute garbage, but I, I feel like you were left with very few cards to play, and so I have a tiny bit of sympathy for him on that mm. one. I don't have any sympathy for TFA or TLJ. <laughs> Yes, and I think we feel too that JJ like put his tail between his legs and he's gone home, shut the curtains. He just doesn't want to come <laughs> out. Again. Like he has some sense that it was a disaster. Where it's right, funny though, that, it's we're like, with him, for, like projects and money, and then do that, and it's like, hey, and they poke at his house, like make something. <laughs> You've got to do. Yeah. Something. <laughs> Would you think but it was just it's... that was the jig was up for him? Like he managed to maintain this veneer that he was like this visionary new filmmaker who this was the guy who resurrected Star Trek and he resurrected Star Wars and you know it, like he seemed to be the guy who just brought back dead franchises and somehow turned them into gold because they made they made bank like TFA whether we we think it's garbage or what it, it made like two billion dollars or whatever yeah, crazy yeah, amount it was yeah. Like, so it was hugely successful, and that's all the people in Hollywood ultimately care about. And so he probably had this incredible reputation up until The Rise of Skywalker. And that's just, like, that's the film that finally exposed him for being a, a bit of a fucking, like, unimaginative hack who just doesn't have any ideas. Okay, I'm going to stick up for JJ a little bit here. I know that's <gasps> not the thing to do, but... Um, I don't understand whoever's in charge. Whoever was in charge of this trilogy, you had to move your hat just to like, yeah. I'm your raging. Head on. <laughs> you were like right. Um, I, whoever was in charge, um, you know, maybe this was a Kathleen Kennedy decision. I don't know. I like to blame her for a lot of things, but um, but why would you have you know different people? running an entire trilogy and people who have very different visions for it on, on top of that. If I think if from the beginning, JJ had been allowed to run all three movies, which I don't even know if he wanted to. So, so I'm not necessarily saying it's someone else's fault, but it, at least his original story made m much more sense. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I'd heard that you know the reason that Ray was so powerful, so intuitively uh, connected with the Force was because Luke Skywalker was was guiding her to come to him to recover, you know his his um, lightsaber and come to him, and that that was completely redconned and and you know we got the the mishmash of terrible ideas that was uh, the Last Jedi and I and I think that from there then you go into it and you were so it's like you taking on a franchise after a very successful three movies with the original trilogy is one thing, but then you having to rebuild from the absolute firestorm that is The Last Jedi is a very difficult, those are like two very difficult things. And I think if JJ had control from the beginning to the end, it wouldn't have been a great product, but it would have been adequate and it wouldn't have been so destructive to characters like Luke Skywalker that it ended up being. Um, so, again, I just want to say I'm not a big fan of his, but I think he was working with pretty pretty bad cards. I think, um, you know, because as, as people like to point out, the original trilogy wasn't a cohesive story from start to yeah. finish either. It was very much um, the, the first movie was wildly successful beyond anyone's expectations. And so the... The reality was, okay, we need to tweak this story to incorporate certain things or to, to work in characters that have been way more popular than we expected. And so we had to change the story. The difference, though, I think, is that they lucked out with the writers and the directors that they ultimately hired, people who really got what they were working with and understood how to integrate their new ideas into the existing story in a way that doesn't give the game away to the audience that, hey, we just changed a bunch of stuff from the original idea because we need to react to what the audience likes. The The problem is they have they had exactly the wrong people on board with this new trilogy. I mean, it, you know, that was one of the problems. The other problem being, like, they, they didn't have a huge degree of imagination, even with TFA. Like, it was just, let's take the, the popular elements of Star Wars that people recognize and produce the most corporatized, safe, bland version 
of Star Wars that we can make, but it made money, you know, ultimately. And you could have used that yeah. as the building blocks of, of a good story if you were imaginative. Unfortunately, they got Ryan Johnson, and he is exactly the wrong guy to be doing the middle movie of a trilogy. He is not a guy who can um, play ball and just set more building blocks in place for the subsequent stories. He just wants to um, divide people. He wants to uh, produce, I guess, in his mind, thought-provoking movies that are going to divide the audience. Uh, that's exactly the opposite kind of guy you want to be doing a film like that. And that just set them on the path to destruction, ultimately. Well, it's the, the OT, like, they brought in other directors, but George was still there. They still, like, even though they were changing yeah. the story, they still had the original brain that the story came out of working through it all. He just handing it to a completely different director, writer, not even connected to the first film. Um, didn't he start writing it, I think, before they'd even Force Awakens was released? That just seems like yep. insanity. Like, how was that ever going to work? You know, it's not well, like... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, we we know it's true at this point that like there was no plan and everything. But even if one one was to consider KK or whoever else at the top, sort of shepherding the trilogy, they never really cared how they connected. Right? They they were just going to go as far as like it's it's Star Wars. This shit will make money. We just got to get directors <laughs> who can make an entertaining experience. Because uh, listening to all the behind the scenes stuff for TFA, it's such a thing of like we're just trying to make the audience feel like this is star wars that's like the primary goal there's no like yeah. we want to tell a wonderful story about these characters that we've built up over a long time because they're going to be great for the star wars universe it's no no no. we want you to feel like this is the ot and it's always mm -hmm. specifically the ot because something that disney have moved away from compared to when they started out with star wars was like yeah we hate the prequels too fuck the prequel they're all like that but you know these days they're like we like the prequel <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool, yeah. Yeah, it seems like Force Awakens was like just objectively because I'm not a huge Star Wars fan. I remember sitting in the, the theater watching Force Awakens and just thinking like this movie feels like it was made by someone who is scared to try something because like foundationally, yeah. you know, it is a carbon copy of the original, just the sh even shittier version. You know, it's like so, what Marvel's doing with like C-list versions or like knockoff versions of the original Avengers. It's something Gary points out a lot, but that first line of TFA is very deliberate. It's um. Oh, Max yeah. von Sydow, right, saying this will begin to make things right. It's like this recognition <laughs> that Star Wars is damaged because of the prequels, and it's so funny to look back on that as a notion. Because <laughs> um, whether or not you think the prequels are, however, good, like they didn't, de they didn't destroy Star Wars as a, as a, like a, you know, money printing brand. If anything, they invigorated it. Oh yeah, the the merchandise and like the spin off games and shows and stuff from yeah. the prequels were enormous. And I mean, it's not like it's been just a few months or a year now. We've actually seen like we're 2023. What what's the sequel culture? What's the sequel fans? They're evaporating with every day that passes. I keep hearing that in 10 years' time, people will love it as much as they love the prequels. But that 10 years is coming around faster than they imagine. <laughs> yeah, <it's coming. laughs> I, I, I just think it's been 10 years that they love the OT, <laughs> and a lot of people say they love the prequels. So that no one will be like, sequels? Didn't they decanonize them? <laughs> well, I think the, the litmus Hopefully. test will be like, what's your attachment to the sequels and the characters within? Uh, okay, well, they're going to mm -hmm. apparently make a new Ray movie. Um, who's going to go watch that? I will. I, I can. You I can. Will, I can <laughs> I can, I'll yeah, but like, we get paid to do it. Just the YouTubers will go. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I can legit see that being the next The Marvels. Yes. You know, it's yeah. just going to, it will follow that same trajectory of no one cares about this anymore. This is, uh, this is just a, a holdover project from a completely different era. Nobody likes these characters and it's just going to die a death. And even you know, just and the saturating on Disney Plus of Star Wars, getting yeah. people to, can go to the cinema and be excited. It's going to be hard, even if the, yeah. the films are good. I think they've just yeah. they've killed off the old fans, and now they've just saturated the new fans with the Ahsoka shit. And What's funny is yeah. like um, there, there's probably a crazy alternate universe where things like Solo and Rogue One, what well, Rogue One did do well, but like Solo did super good, and it spawned like an entire plethora of like origin stories for every character. And like and the Star Wars just became Marvelized. It became the yeah. new MCU. That was like there totally is an that alternate. Hope. That's exactly what they 100% wanted to do with it and just turn it into a money printing machine. Mm. 
Which is funny in retrospect, right? To Marvelize it, it's like, well, they kind of did because it's dead and Marvel's dead. Yeah, but they skipped they skip the profitable part and they just got right yeah. to the end where it just goes <laughs> Where's the money? What's yeah. happening? They're like, you promised us money with this playbook. It's like, oh, oh you just you gave know? us the bad bit. Is there, all my family members and, and like friends I have as well, they'll, they'll be like, you know, when, when is where, like, like if they ask me, like, are you working on like a Star Wars uh, or a new film? Film, whatever, and it's like hasn't been a new one since 2019. They're like, oh, no Star Wars since 2019. Oh, yeah, it's like, no, no, there's been loads of Star Wars. Yeah. It's just stuff that you've it's... never heard of and don't care about. That's all. Imagine, imagine yeah. holding the rights to that IP and not having released a movie in four years. Yeah, I know they're playing That's it like insane. really safe with that it's because fear. I feel like they Absolutely they brought fear. it to Disney Plus thinking that it was going to you know like that would be the safe route and it wouldn't kill the franchise or anything because it's not in theaters but uh it absolutely is like, it's, well, it's like you, you've got decision. oh well you've got when, when you make one of these star wars series on disney plus right whether it's ahsoka or like obi-wan or whatever you've got all the expense of making a movie like because they cost like in total for like 10 episodes or whatever it'd be like a couple of hundred million dollars like the cost mm -hmm. of a good movie um, but you don't get any of the benefits. You don't get the box office revenue from it. Like it's entirely predicated on attracting new subscribers to Disney Plus, mm -hmm. which isn't happening. And so, like, what's what's the point in making these shows? Like, they are they are um, lost leaders, but there's nothing to follow them up. You know that that's yeah. I find it fascinating too. Like, uh, how many people are subscribed to Disney Plus, and then how many people actually watch? You know, like watched Ahsoka or anything. And it's like you obviously make these shows to keep your subscribers happy, but what's the percentage of your subscribers who are actually watching the show? I, I honestly think if they release viewing figures for these shows, we would be shocked by how low they are. Yeah, yeah me too. I really do. You know what would be really cool is to get figures not only of like a general, but like really detailed. Like how many people, how long do they stay for on average? How long before people turn these episodes off? How long do they watch these seasons? Well, didn't we, didn't we find out like with, well, I know this is not Star Wars, but like with Rings of Power, only like thirty-five percent of people actually yeah. watched it all the way to the end. Yeah, I honestly think that's more than I would have expected. <laughs> like, I'm surprised thirty-five percent got through the entire thing. Rings of Power is so empty. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's, it, maybe it was that's just obviously people who were, uh, staying strong and like falling asleep and going back and rewatching it. That's actually a good so. point. It, it would count people who fell asleep, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it would people who like maybe they're just they're trying for the people who have it on in the background while they're while they're like, on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. Like, while they're flicking through their phone or whatever, and or eating their dinner, and it's like oh, it's just something in the background. I can look up occasionally and see some legit, stuff explode. If I like put Netflix on the home pages up, and then I like want to go do something for a second in the room, and it starts like playing something in the background, I'm like, don't you fucking dare! <laughs> that doesn't count. I'm not watching that. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. You're never getting my view. <laughs> I'm just, I'm I just take my view back. <laughs> um, it's hard to I think was... back. Like when Solo came out and lost money, like TLJ sort of whole argument that I was shocked when Solo lost money. I just for I'm afraid we, we can't, can't hear you. you. Can't hear you, buddy. Am I gone? Oh, oh there you're you back. Go. Oh, you're good you're now. Back. You're back. Did you hear any of it? No. I heard TLJ oh, it was at one fantastic. point. Fantastic. I can't remember it's any probably of probably the best point that any person's ever made ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'll never make a good as good a point of that as that ever again. When I really say it, it's gonna sound terrible. No, I was just saying how shocked I was when Solo lost money. I remember, I think of that that a lot because after TLJ we were, you know, making videos, the arguments online, but I was still shocked that a Star Wars film could lose money. No way would I have imagined where we are now and same with mm. marvel as well like I, it's just yeah. hard to imagine getting to this place yeah and they've done it so easy it's just you know now now solo doesn't look that bad i think it only lost 50 million that's nothing these days compared to some films oh dude that's, that's how i feel about every single subsequent superhero movie it comes out like you know like black adam we all talked about how ooh, that didn't make that much money it's like in retrospect it made more than fucking quantum yeah. media <laughs> more than the marvels by far it's like maybe black yeah. adam is the way to go do you see <laughs> Oh, like losing what a, what money time. when YouTubers are literally making more money than the film, mm. that's just crazy. Yeah. I like it, it's crazy. 
Yeah, they've become uh, Disney. Instead of creating entertainment, they've become the entertainment. Watching them, seeing what move they make next, watching the fucking clown shit they put out on our TVs is, is just like, yeah, this is actually hilarious. It reminds me of like um, some of the sort of political debates can end up being way more entertaining as a TV show than as a political debate. <laughs> like you're just watching it as a new episode of House of Cards or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just imagine just being in that position, like as a as a studio, as a company, like just to be someone that everyone hates. It must be like being movie Bob or or like Boogie or so. And like it's like everyone just wants you to fail. Like how demoralizing that must be, just to think, okay, everything that we put out, everyone's just gonna laugh at us and just wants it to like be another colossal failure. Why am I in think- this job? But you'd think that that would convince them to change strategies, but they still feel more and more bolstered. <laughs> they have, I, to... I, I don't know, they have, they have like armor around them that's just unpierceable. They're just so convinced, at least in you know, the higher ups. I'm sure the everyday person just, you know, doing the CGI stuff, he's like, I'm just here for my paycheck. You yeah. want him to bring in the um, Tom Cruise character from Tropic Thunder and yeah. just <laughs> Len Grossman. Oh, oh, yeah. Call With giant call hands. Call yeah, <laughs> you know, even the the Snow White interview we watch, you just can imagine him pacing up and down behind the camera, just pointing at her that she better say the right fucking thing. Yeah, what, is, what if he's I will him? fuck you up? Can you imagine him asking the key grip to punch JJ Abrams in the face, <laughs> <laughs> punch him really fucking hard. <laughs> Oh, I love that movie the key grip guy, like the most muscular guy on the set. Like, yeah. <laughs> he just knew. <laughs> and the way that the key grip is like, sorry, man. Like, yeah, sorry to I got to do it. There were, I was uh, going to ask you guys as well. Like, we've uh, we've we've seen Doctor Who recently. Mm. Unfortunately, for our sins, we've we've experienced it, and it hasn't always been pleasant. That's for sure. Um, but recently, like Christopher Eccleston was asked about whether he would uh, come back to play Doctor Who again. And for, for people who don't know, he was the guy who brought Doctor Who back from the dead. Way back in the, the heady days of 2005, when Mahler was just like a, a small, like eldritch child. Um, <laughs> this, was, uh, this was when Doctor Who came back from like a, a probably 15 year hiatus. Um, and David Tennant might have been the guy who popularized it. Um, once it once it got established, but Christopher Eccleston was the guy who actually brought it from back from the grave alongside Russell T. Davis, and he was asked if he would ever come back to Doctor Who, and this was his response, and I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, obviously it's the 60th anniversary of the show this year, and like I said, people would love to see you both come back at some point. But Christopher, for you, your Experience with only one person. No, come on, everyone. <laughs> and that was my mother. <laughs> Guys, wouldn't you? Who's over to there see... with the beard? <laughs> Mom, you need to shave. <laughs> You'd all love to see Christopher come back as a doctor, right? See. Now, what would have to happen <clears throat> for that to become a reality? Sack Russell T. Davis. Sack Jane Tranter. Sack Phil Collinson sack Julie Gardner and I'll come back. So can you arrange that? Did, did you find it? Oh, I'll pause it just in case we get copyright claim there, but... Uh, Look at the actresses. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. The first thing I was going to say, like, I love how Billy Piper has barely changed in like almost 20 years, whereas Christopher right. Eccleston seems to have aged about 50 years since then. <laughs> I didn't Damn. recognize him first when I saw this clip. I was like, who's that guy? <laughs> Why does it look like Santa Claus now? It looks, yeah. Yeah. It's Christmas. You know, it makes sense, right? You can even say these face there. Fuck them. <laughs> yeah. Because it's funny, right? I um, I thought that the reason he left after one season was he just didn't want to get typecast as the Doctor. He he wanted to move on to other acting projects, and he just uh, didn't want to get too associated with the character, which seemed reasonable at the time. I, I can get that. Um but then you find out this, and he, he does go on to talk a little bit more about the problems behind the scenes, and he said it was a lot to do with studio politics and um, people like doing double deals and stuff behind the scenes and screwing each other over. And he seems to have a lot of ire for Russell T. Davis. And I don't know, man. I think it's kind of interesting, so- the, the shift in attitude towards Russell over the past few weeks. Just to clarify, are you... 
aware or not aware of how long he's been saying this stuff? I wasn't aware until I saw this. I didn't know what he'd uh, what his attitude um, was because his exit from Doctor Who was relatively famous, right? In terms of a, I uh, I think I've talked about it with Gary, but I remember adoring him in the 2005 uh, reboot, and then finding out that he was going and getting replaced by some guy who I'd only seen on Casanova as a TV show. I was like, "You are fucking kidding me." Uh, Tennant's my favorite doctor, by the way. <laughs> like, so he really proved himself with that one. However, uh, the the nature of his leaving was very slapdash and uh, weird. And uh, there was always floating comments and vague references and interviews with him where he was always very um, clearly frustrated. And just over the years, he's let loose a lot of different things about how much he fucking hates the people. He loves all the people who work on the show who are like all, all of the, you know, the lower level sort of like people, you know, making the sets or holding the lights or doing all those sorts of things. But he, he's made it clear he despises the people at the top. And I guess that's a, um, a more culminative uh, statement on the fact that he's like, get rid of every single person who works on that shit. And then I'll come back is a uh, representative of his experience. Cause I think they wanted him to stay on and he probably would have stayed on longer, but that, uh, something happened. Uh, uh, that was somebody didn't like, I think it was, it could have been something to do with the treatment of, um, of the of the workers or something, I can't remember. Well, I, I'll play just the remainder of the clip just so we can get a sense of what his position is on it, because uh, he yeah. does go into a little bit more detail here. Um, like associated with the character, given not at all. I love being associated with the character. Yeah. Just don't like being associated with those people and the politics that went on in the first series. The first series was a mess, and it wasn't to do with me or Billy. It was to do with the people who were supposed to make it and it was a mess. And the first series of any show, Billy did Confessions of a... Cool girl. You know, first series, nobody wants to know. The BBC were like, we're gonna keep a big distance from this. And then as soon as it was a success, they were all up close going, I was responsible for that. But they were all like, at a distance, like this is a folly, Eccleston's folly, Piper's folly. Russell T. D. Davis's folly. And then when it worked, suddenly, oh yeah, I worked on that. They could, wouldn't come anywhere near us. And then they jump on the bandwagon. Those kind of politics, I'm not very good at handling. I can't swallow that shit. Well, the audience was sure to do with that exactly. <laughs> I, I just, he, he's clearly a man who's at the stage of life and, and his career where he's like, no fucks given. I'm just going to tell it like it is. I've got to respect that. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I, I clearly uh, had a bad experience. I appreciate it. That's the thing, yeah. And um, there's plenty of actors. It's funny, we talk about with Marvel all the time with directors and actors who just don't want to be a part of it because of their experiences with it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, he's he's notoriously been at odds with uh, the production of Doctor Who. And it's such a shame, too, because, of course, uh, I think all of us would have loved to have seen more of his Doctor. But that, um, you know, to some extent, you have to respect the fact that we can't, we shouldn't be trying to. Um, Force someone into a miserable situation just because we want to see more of their character yeah. in a story. I mean, I think the fact that he was even there doing interviews about this stuff was progress because, like, for a long time, he wouldn't even go to conventions or anything. Yeah, uh, to do with Doctor Who. So, like, he started to come out well, of the shell in that respect and speak his mind a bit more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's had state was saying like he started doing more and more things like that because he was he was going to make money from it because he needed money. Um, I think that's why he engaged more with the different like appearances to talk about these things. It's um, it's a lot of stuff that Gary's covered. Um, hmm. I think he's particularly annoyed at Christopher Eccleston for a couple of things. I, I don't have as much context. If he was here, he would tell you all about it. Gary, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> But the world needed him most. I would, uh, yeah, would have genuinely love to see a Doctor Who special where it was like him, Matt Smith, and David Tennant. Mm. I think the the interplay between the three of them would have been fucking great. Uh, yeah. But it would have had to have happened about ten years ago. Like, you don't want the new guy involved. You wouldn't invite him along. I just no. <laughs> like if if I wanted to film season two of It's a Sin, I would have him. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, otherwise probably not. <laughs> like, um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't get a sense of like people being terribly enthusiastic towards Gatwa yet. Um, Man, I watched we'll that first special. Us. That's all I've watched, and oh, that was hard going. I don't even. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I got. I got no faith in uh, Doctor Who going forward. Those those three specials. That was a nightmare. 
Molly the, told the, me backstage that Rose is his favorite <clears throat> character now. Why did you? Are you, you supposed to keep that to yourself? Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't like the specials. Yeah. Do you, do you mean Billy Piper's Rose, or do you mean the new Rose? <laughs> yeah, not the original Rose. She, the new Rose. Is, the the new and better. Made, the improved. Rose. And improved. Yeah. She's new. She's uh, she's neither, and she's more, and I, I don't know. She's, Who knows what she is? She's everything. She's everything to everyone, yeah. and that's the important thing. Yeah. They yeah. are the worst actor that. I've ever seen. Uh, not great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um but yeah, I was just gonna say as well, like the the attitude towards Russell T. Davis, like it's so interesting to see the shift over the past few weeks because I think up until fairly recently it was one of cautious opt optimism. You know, um Jody yeah. Whitaker was gone, Chris Chibnall was gone, okay, two people that like were not good for the Doctor Who franchise. Um, hey, the the guy who did all the good stuff is back, and uh, the most popular Doctor of the current era is back as well. Um, that seems great. It seems like everything's looking up. Um, and then we actually saw what he produced, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly. This is not the same Russell T. Davies that uh, was writing 10, 15 years ago. He is a different person now, and yeah. he has very different reasons for wanting to do this show, and they have nothing to do with telling good sci-fi stories it's a big shame but that's uh, there's not to add to that in terms of a summary of what's happened here uh i don't, I don't know what i think of him as a writer anymore but is it just this getting old panic to stay relevant and they just grab hold of these talking points and these what's popular in the media now like do you, is it just that desperation as they get older because like why 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 does he even care about half this shit I think in his case, like, because well, he, he's very openly gay, and so like that means a lot to him. And so, like, one of his most uh, like his biggest recent projects was "It's a Sin," which is all about like the gay culture back in the nineteen eighties with the rise of like the AIDS e epidemic and stuff. And that was obviously something that was very near and dear to him. Uh, fair enough, but like, it doesn't have the platform of Doctor Who. It doesn't have the mass appeal of something mm -hmm. like that. And what you get then is, okay, um, this show is in dire straits. We need someone to come back who can um, steady the ship. Um, would you be willing to do it, Russell? Uh, yeah, sure, I'll do it on the condition that I'm allowed to talk about the things that I'm really interested in and I'm really passionate about now. And it just happens to be, you know, all of this stuff. And so... He comes back. He gets those three specials with Tennant, and then you know the the ongoing series with uh, with Gatwa. And what are they all about? It's all about like gender ideology and um, you know transgenderism, um, LGBT stuff, like all of that, all of the things he cares about. It's a platform. It's not about like wanting to tell uh, an interesting sci-fi story anymore. It's about the social messaging of it. That's what drew him back into it. Yeah. And I think, you know, in those circles, wokeness has reached such a critical mass that it's almost impossible to be in any kind of influential position and resist it. Because I don't think um, a person just, you know, everyday person going about their life really knows how to argue against the, the philosophies that wokeness is pushing. Because even something as simple as like, you know, if someone comes up to you on the street and says, defend monogamy, defend marriage, you'd be like, I don't know, we just do it. You know, it's like there are all these things that we just do that feel normal, feel natural. And someone comes and tells you, no, that's abnormal. You've been brainwashed or, you know, or even even the the overarching there, you know, idea that women are oppressed and. Um, you know, we have, we've created this heteronormative societal structure and patriarchy and all these people are suffering. And so then here comes this ideology that's selling idea of acceptance. And if, and you know, what kind of reasonable person doesn't want to be accepting of diverse people and, and ideas. And so you say, okay, fine. That's, that sounds good. Like, why wouldn't I accept that someone's grappling with their sexuality? So let me let me make sure that they're they're more welcomed in our in any kind of social circle. And then that happens with trans people, and 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 so you're like, yeah, of course. And so it just it kind of just con consumes everybody, and everybody gets initiated because that that base entry line is acceptance and love, and it's the same right. thing 
as as you know Rachel Zegler and Halle uh, Bailey talking to each other and saying you know, look at us, we're so positive, we're so positive, let's reject anyone that's even a little critical of us and, and irritated with us. In it, but in the meantime, if, if Rachel Zegler's being critical, that's not, that's not really looked at as critical and bad because, you know, it's, it's serving this higher purpose of, of gender ideology and like pushing diversity and all, like that whole woke umbrella. And so it's, it's, it's this, brainwashing that's happened for a lot of people, even though they claim like we're the ones brainwashed and granted, like, you know, we all like accept things without really thinking about it too much, but they claim that, that the brainwashing is on the other side. And so it's like these two ideologies going up against each other. And one of them is being really, really successful. I think, um, the, the BBC particularly, like when you're talking about people who make things like Dr. Who, uh, they are a unique case in that they, um, if you want to take like the the most far left um, sort of woke um, people that are, like exist in Hollywood, that is barely a patch on what the BBC is. But it it is that way because they believe that they are still fighting a war within their own organization. Because I've spoken to people, like I've been at publishing events down in London, and I've spoken to people who work at the BBC. And they said to me, like with a straight face, 100% serious, uh, oh, the BBC is a deeply conservative organization and we're still fighting to try and fix that. And I, for for about 10 seconds, I didn't know what to say. And I, all I could say to them was like, look, I can't speak to the culture within that organization. I don't work there. All I can say is based on what you guys make, that really doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> like that doesn't line up with what I've what I've seen from what they produce. Um, but that's the mindset that they have. They still see themselves as a, like a, a, an organization that needs fixing. And so it's only going to get even more extreme as they go forward because they see this as an ongoing war within the BBC and then the wider British culture. That's the scary thing. Yeah. It's hard to believe that's how they see themselves. Like, when that person said that, you must have been like waiting for the laugh <laughs> to the sort of. Yeah. I, I legit, like I say, I legit just didn't even know how to respond. I was looking at them like, "Are you are you joking? Like, are, is this like a piss take or something that I'm just not getting?" And it's like, nope, they were deadly serious. Wasn't and... Jeremy Clarkson the end of their sort of bad image that they when they once they sacked him, I thought they would have been happy with him from I then on. I think he was probably the last. Yeah, like yeah. probably the last like. Uh, truly outspoken person who was just in the middle or perhaps to the right slightly didn't they confirm we got uh clarkson's farm season three and four even though amazon said they were like stopping his shit yeah, yeah I thought it's, that was amazon. it's not the bbc though they announced it after so that they might be getting rid of him you know for the controversy and but no nah, signed up money talks because that's what gary said was like they'll say that just give them a year then they'll just they'll get things back to normal again because he's it's like such a huge you profit. Know, for them. Something like Grand Tour is probably quite expensive to make because like they have to go over the world and drive fast cars and stuff like Clarkson's farm is like, we'll just get a film crew and fucking follow him around his farm. <laughs> the, the ratio of like cost to profit is remarkable for something like that. Um, and that's the thing. I think they know that people would watch Jeremy Clarkson fucking doing his taxes if they could, uh, you know, monetize it. So, yeah, paperwork, and it's still part of the show. I, I, I honestly, I don't know to watch that. By the way, anyone who's listening who hasn't seen yeah. it, yeah, Clarkson's Farm is funny as hell. Grand mm. Tour and Clarkson's Farm are both like required viewing. I think but it's just you you won't you won't uh, yeah. be bored. I don't even I don't it. even think to recommend Top Gear or Grand Tour. So I'm like, well, everyone's already watching that. Why would I need to recommend that? You know, if you're not, you're not human. You know, so. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Clarkson's Farm has some of the best characters you'll ever find on TV, and they're just, they're real yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. They're real people. <laughs> Who's the dude? Like, I, it's not Caleb, but like the the dude who like um, does a lot of the handyman work on the yeah. farm, and he can like Clarkson just can't understand a fucking word he says. <laughs> <laughs> Reoccurring joke of just as <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if that <laughs> funny, trust me. Uh, it's good stuff. But uh, the other, uh, yeah, the one last thing I was going to talk about before we we do a few super chats was, um, you know, we we've all 
experienced the recent spate of DC movies. I'm not going to say we've enjoyed them, but we've experienced <laughs> them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, James Gunn is now taking over. And we, we know what James Gunn's all about as a filmmaker. We've seen the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Um, yeah. How can I phrase this? There's certain people that keep cropping up in his projects. Um, and they all seem to have close personal ties to him, like his brother Sean or his wife, for example. He just, you know, so Absolutely. random. They just keep showing up in his uh, in his projects. Who knew? Um, but Zachary Levi was getting interviewed recently by Deadline, uh, or at least this this came courtesy of Deadline, um, talking about you know his work on Shazam within DC um, and the the relative lack of success that the second movie had. Um, and they said to him, uh, if Shazam won't be flying onto screens anytime soon, would uh, Zachary Levi be interested in playing the, another DC character, perhaps? When asked the question, the actor seemed skeptical that jumping into a new DC character would even be possible. Reminded that Sean Gunn, the actor and brother of DC Studios co-CEO James Gunn, who played Weasel and Calendar Man in 2021's The Suicide Squad, has been cast as villain Maxwell Lord in the new DC universe, he quipped, Listen, when you're the brother of the guy who runs DC, I guess you get to play whoever you want. And how tr- how right you were, Zach. Because we've all seen Sean in the Guardians movies, and I remember him for like the first time I saw him, I was like, why is this random character getting so much fucking screen time? <laughs> like, he, he doesn't seem to have anything yeah. to do with the story. Yeah. And he can't fucking act and he doesn't have any screen presence, but he's just there on the screen like all the time. Why? And then I found out later. Yeah. Okay. It's Sean Gunn. It's his brother. Okay. Well, I, um, I would have compliments for his mocap work, I guess. Because uh, he, obviously he, he did the work for Weasel. I did the work for Rocket. I mean, um, as weasels, like, what can I say? It's like, yeah, okay, he plays a, a fucking weasel. Physical acting is a thing. It's, it's one of the big celebrations I'd have of Andy Serkis. He's phenomenal. It's not just the voice acting. He, he's an all-round, like, 110% amazing actor. But, you know, you need to get the physical stuff down. I think Sean Gunn does. And to provide some level of defense, I mean, we don't... I assume none of you guys take issue with Mike Flanagan hiring the same people ever over and over and over again, right? No, and I, no. I know what the argument you're going to make here because people make the same argument that, like Martin Scorsese just keeps hiring Robert De Niro and like Tim Burton keeps hiring Johnny Depp and like yeah, say the that they're talented people though. Yeah, they can all act. <laughs> That's the difference. Sean Gunn, okay. not so okay, much. Okay, so I'm I'm with you to an extent because I think Sean Gunn probably should stay as mocap capture type roles, and I'm I'm fine with that. I'm with you the character because I had the exact same experience with Guardians Two. Where I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Why do we keep Checking about why is he replacing Yondu like at the mm. end? You know, it's like that's weird. Um, but then that makes you think Michael Rooker, he appears in a lot of James Gunn's work, and nobody's complaining about that because Michael Rooker's awesome. So it really is a matter then you would say of like we need him to be bringing back people who have talent because when Scorsese, Tarantino, Flanagan, whoever else do that, because Flanagan is the funniest one. He basically just switches around the whole cast for the next TV show. You've seen yeah, like all yeah. these people before, but, yeah. but they they're great different characters. Yeah, they are. They're really, really good people, uh, actors. But yeah, with this one, I think if we see Jennifer Holland get cast as something significant, uh, that's going to piss everyone off because yeah, she's so Cause... untested as an actress. It's um, you can only see, and I think I think. In his heart of hearts, James Gunn would be like, "Yes, yes, I'm giving her a role because she's fucking dating me." Yes, sue me. <laughs> We'd be like, I mean, all right. I, I'm <laughs> sure he's. I think he's responded to this on Twitter before, uh, pretty much saying like, "Yeah, I, I've given roles to like people that I know." Like, so what? What are you gonna do? Um, well, like his wife like, working zombie strippers. And, so and again, probably- yeah, but again, it's like it's one thing to have. Um, like a director who has certain actors that they just really enjoy working with, it's like, okay, fair enough. Like you you hit upon certain people that just vibe with you and you can create good stuff. Um, it's another thing to say, I'm going to cast my like not particularly talented brother uh, in, in <laughs> for increasingly big roles in movies to the point where it becomes really distracting. Like that's, that's where people start to just cry nepotism. Yeah, and Zachary Levi has been pretty salty towards James Gunn since uh, the release of Shazam 2. Um, well, in, in definitely. I think WB he's been salty for life though. since the release of Shazam 2. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't blame him. Yeah. This is because it didn't do that well. Is that why? 
Yeah, so yeah. Like him and the director were both uh, pretty upset about how WB treated Shazam 2 uh, with the release date and everything. Yeah, they and, Yeah, they really did. So um, he was, you know, it's the opposite of Rachel Ziegler, where she was just talking shit about the movie. They were just upset about the fact that the movie didn't get pushed like it was supposed to originally. You know, it was the sequel to a successful film. So, Why do you think it didn't do well? No. Um, I, I, I honestly think uh, a lot of these movies, there's a compounding effect with like superhero films at this point because of the fact that like, like you used to be able to look at Marvel movies and think that they're all separate franchises, but I think people now look at it as just one franchise. So if mm. Ant-Man sucks and then, you know, uh, Shaz uh, Shazam 2 wasn't very good um, and uh, Marvel TV show sucks, like that's going to affect every other box office, uh, like every movie. And at that point with Shazam 2 was when um, uh, DC had announced that they were going to completely change everything. So like that movie didn't even matter anymore, or at least people That's were true. confused if it did. Yeah. There's all kinds of factors, I guess. Yeah, if it had released, you know, in 2019 or something, it probably would have done fine. Uh, but it's in a position where it has to fight for its own, like it has to actually be good in order to make money. Yeah. And it, it yeah. just fucking wasn't. It, it was like, just mediocre. Well, that's yeah, kind of you. Uh, <laughs> we went through <laughs> in detail. We thought it was absolutely fucking terrible. Like the the mm. right. We were ready for it to be fine because, um, you know, the first one was quite positively, uh, you know, uh, received by a lot of uh, fans. But this the second one was so much worse. Um, it's, it's a bit of a mess of a film in terms of script, anyway. And and then. Yeah, like like the the nature of like a lot of the bigger world building implications for the the characters, the the wonder a lot of people had about how does this fit into, and then you, you sort of stop yourself like, fit into what though? What what is he even <laughs> into? And it's like yeah, fucking who knows? And so that investment is dying. I know James Gunn recently made a comment of like someone I think he called it cameo porn, and he said we need to yeah, stop yeah, that's cameo good. porn. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the representative of that film. Remember Wonder Woman's fucking appearance in that and in The Flash? They were hilarious. The camera just pans over and it goes, da -da 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 -da, and she's like, hello. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> me. Remember me? <laughs> <laughs> Kalel, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's that planted Gal Gadot acting talent on the display. <laughs> <laughs> but but also, I, do you guys think, you know, people are kind of sick of the Marvel style humor that's kind of gotten into everything? Like every trailer you watch before a movie, it'll be that same kind of like something big will happen and then it'll pan to the main yeah. person and he'll make some wry comment about it and like, whoa, that's crazy. It's just it's it's like there's nothing serious anymore. Mulder and I had a pretty lengthy discussion about this of um, like Joss Whedon essentially getting blamed for all of the ills of modern writing, where it's like that's just a, a complete Joss Whedonism. Um, and where it's like when you see him at his best, when he actually was allowed to have creative control over things, like when he was doing things like Buffy, when he was doing the Avengers, um, the the ratio of like puns and self aware humor to actual dramatic moments was way like wildly different to what we have now. The problem that I think we have now is cheap imitations of that style of humor and that style of mm -hmm. writing. That's what's like absolutely killed things like the MCU. And and you know, the was, delivery, uh, like that humor relies so heavily on charismatic actors and yeah. being able to deliver that. And then you watch the novels and they're trying to mm -hmm. do, you know, the Robert Downey Jr. sort of humor. And it's like, you're not that person. You know, there's you have to have charisma and some style to your delivery, even if it's just a dumb joke. You know, a, sort of a dumb look at something happening. You still need that charisma, and that and that's just missing from the people in these films these days. Um, for the drinkers referencing uh, the last catch up we did, and for those who don't listen to those, what are you doing with your life? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. go and do uh, it right now. Yes, uh, but after the last one, uh, I did show him some clips of Angel Season 5, and I was like, this this shit is Whedon when he's like allowed to make the things at the best of his ability. And, you know, you get really shit things from him as well. Uh, there's no denying that. But yes, the uh, the Marvel humor. It's funny, we uh, we may have checked out a little bit of a, a couple of clips from Lord of the Rings not so long ago, right? And you know when they're entering uh, Moria, you have Gimli saying that... Um, He's so excited for everyone to be here. They're going to be taken care of, getting their food and drink. It's going to be wonderful and stuff. And then we gradually realize 
the skeletons. It's completely dark mm. and there's goblin arrows everywhere. And he and he starts to basically lose his mind. He's like, no, 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 like like because he's mm. realizing all the people are dead more than likely. And uh, we would come and was like, you know, what? I wouldn't put it past Marvel if they were making it for him to look around and be like, this is weird. Yeah. <laughs> And then it'd be like, that's, they, that's they were more alive the last time I was here. Yeah. And then, like, once the Watcher destroys the walls and they're cr trapped, instead of Gandalf saying, now we must face the Dark of Mori, he'd be like, well, that was, that was crazy. Let's get going. And you just wouldn't well, feel any of it. And it's, it's, so it's not even just jokes. It's just that represent, like, that fucking understanding of the tone and the fear of ever putting the audience in a place where they feel uncomfortable or sad. Right. They have to rush to a joke. They have to rush to resetting the 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 tone immediately. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, a well-placed piece of humor, a bit of levity can lighten a really dark moment because you need that balance sometimes. Like, if it's too unrelentingly grim and dark and dramatic, like, it just becomes depressing and exhausting. Um, but if you go over the score with it and you, you feel like you have to constantly guard your audience against feeling anything about feeling any like weight or or significance to any moment uh you just rob the movie of any dramatic tension because there's nothing that means anything there's just gonna be another joke there to lighten the mood and yeah that that's that's where they've gone wrong more than anything is in terms of tone it's just feeling like ever nothing can be taken seriously it all has to be turned into a joke God, Godzilla minus one shows that the audience wants it too. Like I'm always worried that they're training the audience to just like this shit and we're never going to get good films again. And then like when I was watching Godzilla minus one, the whole time I'm thinking, I hope other people are enjoying this. So <laughs> like, I yeah, hear but like in the cinema, I'm thinking, is everyone else enjoying this? Please enjoy this, you know? And then people are loving it, you know, and mm -hmm. they love the drama and the, the, uh, the, the tension and the sad bits yeah. that, you know, it's that, that's made me as happy as watching the film. That people it, like it's the, they want. It, it's this. Uh, it's almost like a. An, I guess now it would be seen as almost naive and um, and simplistic. The idea of just like earnest heroism and drama and stakes, you know, and not having to undercut everything with like some postmodernist piece of ironic, self-deprecating humor. You know, the, you know the idea that like people can just al be allowed to sometimes feel um, the stakes of a moment and a character can be allowed to do a heroic um, act and not feel like you have to just make fun of it. Like, oh, isn't it goofy that he's trying to like sacrifice himself to save the world? Like, isn't that so passe? No, like people want that sometimes. They just want to see characters being heroes sometimes. It's, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's all those aspects that have been mentioned. I would even say it goes far for, for horror or for awe or for heroism or for uh, tragedy. It's like they, they don't want to touch any of these things too much. They can, it's like, ooh, we don't want to... You know, irreverence, that's that's what we got to do mm. with all of these. Whenever something... Like, when, when when Gandalf's reading the um, the entries from the diary and, and, and you know it gets scarier and scarier listening to how it was all happening and so quiet in the room and stuff, and then it starts to build up when... Uh, uh, Pippin knocks off the stuff into the well. But imagine that Gandalf looks at the guy with the book and goes, I guess he didn't make it. <laughs> it, it you'd just be like, Ugh, God, stop. <laughs> like, please, just take this or, seriously. There were, yeah, or there would be an entry in the diary that says, like, if you find this, like, please delete my browsing history before my yeah. wife finds it or something. Like, just something <laughs> goofy like that, yeah. It's like, you don't, you don't have to undercut every serious moment with a bit of self-deprecating humor because if you do that, nothing matters anymore. Yeah, and, the, and the, that, those types of jokes worked for Avengers because it was, a, you know, a Marvel, uh, you know, it was a comic book movie and you had moments of seriousness and then you had moments of levity and, and it just, it kind of flowed. It, it showed everybody's personality. It just flowed well. But that you knew that that was the style of movie that they were making, but now it's yeah. just infused into everything. Remember um, when Cap first stands up to Loki, right? And it's relatively serious, referencing um, World War II and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, it's obviously because they're in Germany, right? And, and yes. Loki very seriously is like, kneel before me or I'll fucking kill you. And he goes to kill someone there as well. When Iron Man arrives, he opens up every last like missile and machine gun he has on Loki that says, make a move. And then he Reindeer, just turns, he, he calls he, him reindeer, yeah, reindeer games. games. 
Yeah. It's a good move. Yeah. Like it's it's very it, it, and it's it's all dependent on the characters and what we expect of them, right? Because in Iron Man one and two, that is Tony Stark. He would say yeah. stuff like that. And then Cap, you know, he's like Mr. Stark, so sort, of, sort of thing. He's like yeah. Cap. And you, you have the conflict between them, taking things very seriously on Cap's end, not so much on Tony's end, which yeah. creates one of the more shared now scenes of when they break apart in Avengers, filled with quips, but also very serious criticisms from each of them about each other's characters. It makes for the balance. It's very hard to do. I wouldn't deny that. It's just that it's, um, it's like infected all forms of um, experience for the audience. We can't let anyone go anywhere too distant away from just being chill. We're all just chill. We're just hanging out and watching a movie. Nothing too extreme, okay? Well, I, I, is it this sort of simple-minded view of if the audience isn't laughing, then they're not entertained? Like, if they're sitting there in silence absorbing a dramatic moment, like, whoa, well, how do we know if they're, like, enjoying themselves? Because we don't have a really obvious visual cue. So we have to make them laugh constantly. <laughs> That's entertainment. It's like no trust in your script, no trust in your own audience, no anything like that. Well, I think they're I, just, I, run, just running it so like a corporation. They're just like, we're yeah. McDonald's. We can't have spicy burgers because we're McDonald's. Like everything's got to be on this level playing plane so we can get the most people in the cinema that we can. They, they have no trust in the audience whatsoever. You know, and they, it's almost like a sitcom style writing now. Yeah, because yeah. if there's like a baseline, everything, you know, in an episode of a sitcom, you'll have some extraordinary circumstance, but at the end of the episode, everything will be back to baseline. Yeah, I, I watched it, this. I haven't watched a lot of movies from the 70s and 80s. So I've, I've been lately going back to those because, you know, there aren't too many good movies to watch right now. And um, I watched. 90s. <laughs> yeah, I watched a YouTube video that did a, a comparison between. A murder, uh, the murder, a murder on an, on the Orient Express, the yeah. one that was just released, and then one that was made in the seventies, and so I stopped the video and I went back and I watched the original because I'd never watched it, and then I watched his review and one of the things he talked about is that there's no trust in in the audience, like you guys are saying that everything in the new movie needed to be just turned, you know, mm -hmm. to a hundred that you couldn't even stay on the train. They took every opportunity possible to take the murder, you know, discussions around the murder that, you know, Poirot is trying to solve. They would kept taking it out and infusing all these like action and, and like movements rather than actually focusing on the dialogue and the characters and the subtleties of like cap capturing every little, uh, expression and the staging and and uh, these are things that I I don't really I'm not really a movie critic and and so it's for me these these are not the things that I notice so it was really interesting to go back and watch something done so well that that films like that and like the books obviously that they're based on they fall within the genre of the cozy mystery where um it's all predicated on the murder is essentially just an intellectual problem that the detective has to solve. Like the detective uh, and the characters around him are generally not in danger. They don't have to go through like action scenes. They don't have to fight for their lives. They have to just uncover clues, learn things about people and figure out who did the crime and why. That is a, a very compelling genre, but it, it relies on audiences having a bit of patience and being willing to like sift through the information and uh, and slowly come to the same conclusion as the characters. It takes time and it takes focus. And like you say, filmmakers now, big studios especially, they don't have that level of trust in the audience that they're going to stick with it. And so they have to interject it with like, big action set pieces that go outside the confines of this initial mystery because if if things aren't happening and people aren't running around and fighting for their lives then how are we going to care about anything that's going on and it completely misses the the point of the genre it misses the point of the mystery um they want the romanticism of that murder mystery like the the period um, details the 1920s aesthetic and stuff but they want it infused with the the fast pace of a modern action movie, and they they don't gel. They don't work together. Um, that's why you'll have so much more enjoyment out of watching these these murder mystery adaptations that they did in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties yeah. on on British TV than you will with what Hollywood produces now. Hey man, Glass Onion was great. Yeah. Uh, uh. What did you yeah, say? You get so so used Fuck to Fuck that movie. <laughs> Glass Onion, a movie that I feel like oh. would be a drink or something. A few other people did, but uh, 
Good God, anyone who praises that as like <laughs> top oh, notch. So bad. Don't you don't you know more? I'm a dishonest critic for like saying that, yeah. that movie's a piece of shit. You lied. You tried to make it seem worse than it was, even though yeah, you even though I literally showed it. direct evidence of how fucking misleading and, and uh, manipulative that film yeah, is. Yeah, but it's such yeah. an eye-catching title. The drinker lies <laughs> to his audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the worst power part. of stupidity, you see. The worst part sure. about that movie was was you know with these high def cameras it picks up everything and and everyone's makeup and skin just looked so it actually just was making me uncomfortable just watching it. It like not even <laughs> this is not even about aging. It was just like the blotchiness of the makeup was just was weirding me out. I was going to say did they look like plastic people, but was it yeah. more just like the makeup was really bad and just didn't didn't cover. <laughs> Didn't cover all the uh, imperfections of the film, and but I was shocked at the comments on the video I did. Just people going, "It was great." What are you talking about? You got no <laughs> idea. It was just. I thought it was just going to be common knowledge. Yeah, um, it's like the the, the 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 feedback is kind of like, "Haven't you heard the fucking Beatles song? It's about how oh things are fucking God. obvious and hidden in plain sight." It's like, yeah, that's not an excuse for making a dumb as fuck movie, like. Just because it acknowledges so the fact that it's dumb doesn't make it better. You, you have to like it if it's dumb because that, that means it was doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, Mel Commander was visiting and uh, it came out on Netflix and I was like, <laughs> oh, it, it could be good. Like, because I doubt you'll fuck it up again, right? Like, Knives Out was terrible. So I'm sure this one will be all right. We watched it. I think by the time the house exploded, I was like, how is this film real? Like, how, how do you fuck this up so badly? It reminds it, me of the whole like hyperbole. Of, hyperbole. It, it's yeah. very much like it's like Thrawn from Ahsoka. Oh. It's like mm. a stupid person's idea of what a smart movie should be. The, that's that's <laughs> the thought process behind it. It's like if we couch <laughs> if we couch this in a in a layer of self aware irony, then we yeah. can get away from we can get away with the fact that it's actually dumb as fuck, and like it's, we know it is. It's the Breaking Bad meme, right? It's when you watch Knives Out and people tell you. Yes, all the characters are retarded. Yes, the interesting part of the film is just the fact that the detective wants to find a way for Marta to not go to prison, essentially, and to screw over Chris Evans, who is a dumbass, and that's why he loses at the end. He's a fucking idiot. You're like, okay, glass onion. So, and then they cut you off and say, no, everyone's stupid. That's the point. Everyone's super retarded. That's why it's so interesting, is how retarded all the characters are and how retarded all the writers. And you're just sitting there like, so... This just you're pretending to be retarded or just is retarded. Like what? what I got, and then you just like I don't even fucking know what the difference is anymore. No one does. Uh, I, I want to know how you've got to be smart to be able to get away with that sort of film planning. Just well, it's meant to be stupid, and people go along and get in the comments and abuse you if you don't like it because don't you know it's meant to be stupid? I want to be smart enough to be able to convince people. Yeah, my video is meant to be crap. Just watch it and tell everyone else it's great because it's meant to be. <laughs> I don't know. It's like Ryan Johnson's got this like weird reality distortion field around him mm. where he can somehow convince people that he's this visionary auteur filmmaker. Like that, like his intellect is so far above everyone else's that like you you just have to praise his work blindly because you're not of the you right keep intellectual plane. Yeah, away to with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I did like this will one never here. Understand. <laughs> we, we've got to donate to baggage claim to buy and watch the best 70s and 80s movies we need to learn good storytelling so yeah you should do a whole yeah. series just watching old movies and just reacting to them yeah you know and, because you know, i grew up in i grew up in india pre-globalization so i watched a lot of like 40s and 50s things and then i completely and skip 60s but i completely skipped over the 70s 80s and 90s because by the time that all got there i'd already come here it was like this weird thing where i just like missed like a whole bunch of american culture just don't watch Not any cool. modern movies ever and just like yeah. devote all your time <laughs> yeah, to just watching those. like the 70s 80s and 90s like there is it's infinitely better than what we have now yeah that's i'll just keep keep at it make it a series like you're saying um, should we do some super chats? Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, Chuxenhausen says, uh, Hail chat. Just wondering, Drinker, if you'll watch the Iron Claw when it opens next week. I absolutely will. Yeah. Um, yeah, quite interesting. That it's all about the Von Eric family from from like the wrestling days and hmm. you know how they. I guess they gave quite a lot to the wrestling business and sacrificed quite a lot and probably didn't get rewarded very well for it. So I'll be interested to see how they represent that on screen. 
Um, Whale in Bacephus says, serious question, uh, Anita Hoare or Buster Hyman? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, there's one for the, <laughs> the panel. Beautiful. Um, he also says, Tug McGroin or Barry, Mc Barry McCrockener? <laughs> uh, you, you absolute card, you. Um, David Lamplow says, Mahler will not stop until he takes over every podcast on YouTube. The Mahlerverse keeps expanding. Hey, they, I at least called for the latest podcast I've joined. I said two hours max, so I got that, all right? I'm putting limits on. It's getting ridiculous. It is. <laughs> Uh, also, what is everyone's favorite war movie and why? Um, I mean, I can go with the simple direction of Saving Private Ryan because the amount it makes me feel <laughs> like that film is amazingly well created and uh, it makes me think all kinds of I, I, everything that I think Spielberg wanted me to think about, I thought about with that movie. I'll, I would uh, say I'll go 1917. Oh, sorry, sorry. But, uh, I know it's a more recent one, but that movie just had me on my the edge of my seat the whole time. I think that's a pretty good, good choice. Yeah, um, I will go with now because I like the story behind it as much as I like the film. Yeah, the, the, film the, the, the now is as good as the film. <laughs> I, I think yeah, when you you see the film and you just keep thinking about what what they had to go through to get that thing made, it's like, um, <laughs> it adds to the experience. I just love the idea that Dennis Hopper was just coked out of his fucking mind Oof. the entire film, <laughs> just <laughs> ranting absolute gibberish. And Marlon Brando was yeah. just being Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando, yeah. Uh, when I choose... talk about Marlon turned up fat, he didn't realize he was so fat and what they were going to do with him. <laughs> well, he he it's turned up fat human. and he hadn't read the book, so he didn't know anything about the source material. He refused to read the script. And if, <laughs> I think eventually, like, Coppola fucking like, locked him in a room or something and ranted at him for like a couple hours. And then he showed up the next day, he shaved his head bald, and he's like, okay, I'm ready to be Colonel Kurtz now. And then, yeah, <laughs> proceeded to just, like, talk absolute a, nonsense for, like, days on end. It's that Tropic Thunder quote. I don't read the script. Script reads me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't break character until I've done the DVD commentary. <laughs> um, I, I think I'd probably choose Platoon, actually, just to stick with the Vietnam theme. Um yeah, I, I think that idea of conflicting philosophies in a war where like people are just losing their absolute minds, um, and there there really is no ultimate like good guy and bad guy. It's just surviving the whole thing. Um, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I will go with the Deer Hunter. I almost picked Saving Private Ryan too, but I think the Deer Hunter is probably my favorite. Um, yeah, uh, I love the. I mean, the story is incredibly tragic, but uh, I liked being able to follow the full journey, like from uh, before they're deployed to what happens when they are, and uh, the conclusion of you know De Niro and Walken's friendship at the end. I thought that was just an incredible film. Yeah, but that film sticks with you, like it's yeah. a hard one. To yeah, uh, you you'll never watch uh, Russian Roulette the same way again. Like yeah. that, that that movie really does it. It really nails it. it um, it's too real, like. All of the party scenes, just in walking around the streets, it just feels too real. That film, it's amazing. The, the, yeah, well, that's what you get when you've got amazing actors at the top of their game. It's just like mm. it, it totally suckers you in. Casualties of War. That's uh, that's a great movie, actually. That's another Vietnam one. Um, I think it's Michael J. Fox that's in that, and it's a really like heavy role for him. Um, but yeah, it's like an American platoon. Like they they um, take a, a Viet Vietnamese girl hostage. And like torture her and end up murdering her, and it's like his attempts to like um, expose what happened, and so um, that is that is a hard hitting movie. Um, yeah, good film. Um, Jeff Romadix says Hollywood needs to heed their own Dave Ramsey to help uh, deal with these over budgeted projects. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, Go for Broke says, "What are the panel's favorite movies and TV shows of this year?" Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> you want to know what my favorite movie of the year is? Um, it's the Killer. Yeah. Oh, Robot Head, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I had problems with The Killer. I keep meaning to make a video on it, but then I'm so behind on making videos, I don't know if it'll ever happen. But I found a good, once I watched that, it, it got me into a, a, a few nights of catching up on uh, 70s and 80s films like that. Watch Thief and a few others, and yeah, it, it, 
I wouldn't say it's terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but I did, I did have some problems with it. I loved it, but to be fair, I haven't seen Godzilla minus one yet, and a lot of people are picking that. Um, yeah, it's, that's it's out tomorrow for Britain. We get it tomorrow. <laughs> Woo! I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm excited I'm to, hear what to go you see to it for it. for real this time. For us, it's already out of theaters. I missed it here. I don't know why. Yeah, really? it's I, I think they, Yeah, I think they're extending the run in the US because it's been so popular. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll it, check. Not necessarily everywhere because I imagine mm. every state's got their own cinema chains and stuff, but. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, it, it's obviously not the most like artistically um, potent film of the lot, but like, yeah, probably the most fun I had this year was Godzilla minus one. Um, I just mm -hmm. like just felt like such a good old fashioned adventure monster movie, and I was just uh, having a blast with it. And I felt really good when I came out of the cinema. I was like, yeah, I watched a damn good movie there. Um, Oppenheimer was obviously. A great yeah. film as well um yeah. and in terms of tv shows for me um possibly the fall of the house of usher or yeah, blue eye yeah. samurai which i'm currently working my way through and very much enjoying because loads of people recommended it to me and they were their recommendations were good it's uh it's been a great show so far yeah i would say oppenheimer um, but tv show wise i don't think i've seen any any new stuff that i really enjoyed lately um godzilla minus one is probably my favorite movie of the year too i hate that i my, my microphone and internet sucked last week so i'm doing a review of it this time um but also i really loved talk to me uh, i thought that movie was fantastic um but i didn't watch any tv shows this year really hmm. all right uh all right next one is tgv monster says um, so how do these Disney Plus shows make money? They cost millions. I guess they're supposed to draw people into Disney Plus, but do they think Ironheart can actually do that? Uh, well, they might think it. We don't. Um, <laughs> I guess the model Please. is based on the idea that you're going to get more subscribers to come in and they're going to like pay your, your monthly revenue and it's going to gradually make the, the cost back. But it's, it could absolutely be the mind. isn't. A bunch of these projects, especially the Marvels, was made at a time where they could put out anything and it would make money. That's when that was, you know, set in motion. They were like, yeah, yeah make that, put it out, make that, put it out, make that. And it's only gradually that they've started to drain completely to the point where now if the Marvels is suggested, they'd be an absolute no. They're not making a Marvels 2. There's no way that's happening now. <laughs> Are you we sure, Marvel? It would be funny though. <laughs> the <Every> movie would <laughs> All of this, I would like, equally have said, like, what a dumb decision to make a Ray movie. But it's like, here we are. So it'd be so funny if they made the like the Marvels too. And it's like, let's see if they can crack a hundred million this time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> trying to break records in the opposite direction. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, Elijah I just said, realized. I, I sorry, I just realized Beef was this year. That was a great show. That was. I've heard a lot of recommendations for that one. Yeah. yeah. That was actually, I think that was my favorite. Fair it is. Fair it is. Um, Patient Elijah says, Hey, Drinker, uh, have you ever thought about making a Drinker Fixies video for any of the following? The Matrix 4, ugh, Last of Us 2, ugh, or the latest Tomb Raider trilogy? Ugh. <laughs> did you not do a Drinker Fixes for anything to do with The Last of Us 2? I thought you did. No, uh, yeah, I did not. Um, I made my review of it and then I suggested a whole bunch of ways you could have done a better story revolving around Abby and Ellie. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, not a specific drinker fixes, but yeah, I think my ideas were better than Neil Druckmann's. Wow. So, I feel like how to fix Matrix Resurrection just not to make that fucking movie. I, I think so, yeah. The only, the only winning move is not to play. That one's yeah. got the glass onion defense. People are like, uh, did you know that they were like forced <laughs> to create the movie and so they made it like a self aware piece of shit movie? And it you're like, not matter. So a piece of shit movie. <laughs> that's what it is then. <sighs> like, what? <laughs> um, the next one is from Poopy Pants, who says, Ultra base take of the day. So you know you're in for some wisdom here, Ooh. boys. Miles Morales is a woke Spider Man wannabe who shouldn't exist, and anyone who thinks he's popular is delusional. Book him. Uh, I mean, that is that is ultra based. I mean, I would probably say like he is a Spider Man. He's just not the Spider Man, and no amount of uh, cajoling and guilt tripping is going to make it that way. But I think he's a good character in his own right. It's just I don't want to see him 
replace Peter Parker. I just want to see him complement yeah, Peter Parker. Yeah, I'm happily in the Absolutely. team that um, it would be better for him to have his own superhero name and persona. I've seen people sharing. Is it the newest issues of his comics? He has a sword now. They gave him a sword. Uh, I don't know. I I stopped reading his comics uh, a few years ago, but um, I'm sure that's like. He'll go back to baseline. I think the biggest problem with Miles is like every one of his villains is just a derivative or or a Peter Parker villain. Like he doesn't even have his own villain. Because uh, I saw Spider-Man subreddit being really mad at this. They were like, why the fuck would they give him a sword? That doesn't match him at all. And I was like, yeah, in what universe would a sword be Spider-Man's weapon? You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> um, so yeah, I definitely see it like a... Is... Yeah. I, I could see like a samurai Spider-Man. That'd be kind of cool, but yeah, not Miles Morales. But uh, I quite liked him in Into the Spider-Verse, like the story. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, it, it's it's in a way kind of hampering him if if you make him, especially that weird stuff with the uh, the Spider-Man games. I, not that I played them, I just you know I know about all the discourse surrounding them and the. Uh, I don't know if you guys have caught the competition between Spider-Man and Baldur's Gate, <laughs> like this thing that's been happening back and forth. The fans being angry at each other because of the uh, Game Awards, because Spider-Man Two. Oh didn't yeah, get I did catch that. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been they wild. Were for, like, seven um, things. There's been huge Maybe conversations about the nature of cutscenes and then QTEs and like spectacle gameplay versus the most mechanically um, dense games of all time. Where it, I feel like this might be a little too far away from topic for some people here. I don't know, but just games used to be a lot more, um, you know, in depth, complicated, mechanically uh, optional, and that's what, it was really neat to see Baldur's Gate three get so many awards, considering it's a crazy uh, experience. From I need to play it. Is kind of what I'm getting at, but. You know, Spider-Man Two. The, the there's all the controversy surrounding what's going on with the use of the Spider-Man characters, but there's also the fact that the game was really short, and a lot of it, most people just talk about how it feels to swing around the city, and it's like anything else. And then it didn't win any awards. There's those are controversies around it. Spider-Man is a interesting IP right now. All kinds of crazy things going on. There's a battle for the soul of Spider-Man, it seems, and like I just hate that it becomes this competition of like, well, who's the the legit Spider-Man? Who's the main one? Who's the the one that we're going to tell stories about? Like, why does it have to be like that? Why can't they yeah. you just have, you know, different characters who happen to have that same mantle, but they're they're individual people? They don't have and you to tell like, different stories through them. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be a competition because when you do that, you automatically turn some of the fans against this new character and. Yeah, it's kind of shit that they turn Miles Morales into this battering ram in like culture war, um, you know, conflict, and it's unnecessary. He's uh, a new Ray Skywalker. Apparently, he is getting a power. Yeah, he's upgraded with a power in his energy sword upgrade. I've just seen. On what screen. the fuck? He, right, he, he has he, like a venom sword. blast, right? So, what does he like charge up the sword with it or something? I don't know. He's holding this sort of glowing <laughs> white. Well, isn't it Spider-Man sporting an energy sword? That sounds so retarded. <laughs> I mean, cor correct me if I'm wrong as well. Does the game not go out of its way to portray Miles as being like better than Peter in every way? Like, there's a point where Peter gets possessed by um, the Venom like, symbiote, so he's like super powerful and like he's way more uh, destructive than he would have been by himself. And Miles just beats him by himself because he's that good. I like I mean, it's the, the same new thing they did in Doctor Who, right? Like. Oh, it's it sucks that you're not a woman anymore. You would already know this. Yeah, <laughs> I like the Peter had to wear a uh, pink bathrobe and a baby carrier the whole way through the. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's amazing how people just refuse to see what they're trying to do with Peter Parker. And I know he's not the Peter Parker, but like we know exactly what he represents in that film. But but Miles Morales fans, they're very very passionate. I've yeah, still, still daily copping abuse about not loving that film. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I love every so often Gary will just post on on Twitter like, yeah, Peter, you know, um, Miles Morales is Miles Morales, <laughs> and Peter Parker is Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, it it just people that, go absolutely yeah. nuts over it. He just has to say the Miles Morales part. It's like the, this lovely short little poem that just sends people insane. <laughs> Yeah, because that's again, that's the thing that turns you off his character in some ways because you know exactly what he represents for so many people. He's there is just... a frustration 
in the fact that Across the Spider-Verse tells us that he is the primary Spider-Man that wants right. to breach the system. He's the one yeah. that sees through the flaws in the system of letting people die in order to save the universe. He's not going to let his loved ones die. That's annoying as a Star Wars mm -hmm. Spider-Man fan. <laughs> like, He's going to fix the Spider-Man like, story. Yeah, He's it's like, I feel like a lot of Spider-Mans would have come to this conclusion. Why is Miles the main one that's doing that? That's kind of annoying. And then secondly, like Miles will be replacing Peter and Spider-Man from now on for the Insomniac games. It's like, why? What, what, why well, we know exactly why, and it's like the same reason he'll end up replacing him in the movies and then in the comics, and like eventually Peter will just be written out altogether. That's what they want to do so fucking hard, and like you know, they know that they have to do it gradually, and that's what's going to happen. I what, mean, what did, isn't there a backstory about it all to do with like, the ownership of Spider Man? And didn't didn't all that change recently? So I've cork was settled. I've had it explained to me before, but I can never quite remember exactly how all of it works. But I think Gary knows it back to front. Yeah, I think Eric that the whole family, you know, are trying to get money out of Marvel, Sony, whoever owns them. And so the idea was to avoid giving them too much money, bringing this new replacement character. But apparently they just had some settlement in a court case about it all. So it, it might be their plans might. Hmm. Hmm. Um. I've got one from Levi Holler for $100 who says, Hail drinker and panel, here's something uh, for the bottle for the holidays. Bit of an off question for this forum, but did anyone catch the Game Awards recently? Highlight for me was seeing Mackie flounder a bit on stage. Also, baggage claim, try out They Live, classic 1980s movie. Yeah. Yeah, do watch They Live. It's excellent. It's uh, I didn't watch... The Game Awards, but I've seen a couple of highlights like Christopher Judge saying his speech went for longer than the newest Call of Duty campaign, which is funny. And apparently, <laughs> several of the people behind that game are fucking mad at him for saying it. And it's like, dude, just he's just run with the joke. It's chill. He's, he's just telling it like it is as well. <laughs> yeah. Christopher Judge um, keeping it real. The other thing I heard was there was apparently like almost more ad time than there was awards or something. I, uh, I don't know the specifics on it because like I didn't watch it, but a lot of people were pretty mad um, at the nature of the the whole thing, and like a lot of the speeches were, you know, told to like to hurry up, move on. We got some more ad space to sell. It's like, uh, okay. yeah, wow. Uh, Master, Master of Puppets says, "Hail Drinker." I'm confused as to how Captain Marvel knows who Carol is. It's not like Carol did an Iron Man press tour and told the world. She's only been to Earth like three times and hung out with the Avengers. Uh, Captain Marvel is Carol Danvers, so I'm not. I think, I think you mean Miss Marvel. I assume Marvel that's yeah, that's maybe what he meant to say. Yeah, it is weird that she's like a superstar, and then you think, how many times has she actually been to Earth and done things? That's true. Uh, she tanked a punch from Thanos, you know, so that makes her a, a legend, I guess. <laughs> um, RRTNZ says, Hail Drinker, no CN jokes this week. Just want to say well done, sir, for great content and supporting smaller channels this year, e.g. Um, the Outcast Creative and Mr. Brown. Also, Chuck Norris makes onions cry. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Um, Mr. Lucas says, hey, Mauler, why wasn't uh, Steamboat not in the Marvels number 61? And could you get a stream with Drinker, Gary, and Theory? Would be interesting. Hell yeah, we could do that. If, uh, yeah, we could do it. Board. I, would chat I am on board. board. We should, well, I wanted to wait until the next Star Wars thing was out, like the next TV show yeah, or whatever, yeah. and then bring Theory in for that. It would be nice to have him on open bar. Hear his thoughts. That could definitely work. Um, RRTNZ says, got a couple of suggestions for the list. Tokyo Vice TV series, gritty, gripping, and enjoyable, and Insomnia, an early Nolan murder mystery. Cheers. Ah, that I is remember awesome. that one. Yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Uh, Grimnack says, Mauler, what is your opinion on the parody movie Cabin in the Woods? Ah, that is written by Joss Whedon. Um, oh, I'd have to rewatch it. Um, I didn't like as much as everyone else did when I first saw it. Um, I thought it wasn't as smart as it thought it was, but it's been a long time. So if I was to rewatch it, I might you know, give it a better shot, especially because I'd appreciate more parody movies at this point of how shitty films have gone. I think it, it does a good job of parodying where the horror genre was at the time. Like, it's probably quite dated now, but uh, 
I think it, it was pretty much on the money then, and well, the, the ending was really good. <laughs> I think when Chris Hemsworth gets splattered into a dome, I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> we're in for a really weird movie. So yeah, <laughs> I think I should give it another chance before talking about it. I just like the controller what? guy who's always disappointed, like, oh, I wanted a merman. <laughs> then he finally yeah. gets one. <laughs> um he also says, uh, also Christmas over Halloween forever. Yes. No, Shad too. had it right. Christmas yeah. is the dawn. <laughs> that is true. Um, Ethan Rackman says, the only hope for the Ray movie is Daisy Ridley forcing it to be good, knowing that she won't get a job after it, so take away failing up. Star Wars is saved. Probably not. I think, no. uh, it's probably advisable for her agent to just stay on the Star Wars sort of the, the teat, milk it, uh, if they do another trilogy with you, take it. May as well. There's not many roles. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd, I hope her. I hope her agent used that metaphor. Like, stay on that teat, <laughs> milk it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Angry Batman says, working on the final Ryan Drake novel. Loved the whole series and sad to see it ends. Just got my shirt and sticker yesterday too. I'll go away now. Excellent man. Thank you very much. And. Who knows? Maybe it wasn't the end. Maybe I'll do more. Um, M8566 says, Hail to the bar. We need more Godzilla minus one talk. When's the happy hour EFAP breakdown and dare I say it, the unbridled praise? Cheers. Oh my God. Well, i got to see it, it first. Yeah. <laughs> Let me do that. Maybe the thing is, it is out tomorrow, um, but I don't know when I'm going to be able to put time away to see it exactly. I'm super busy right now editing some stuff, but um, yeah, I want to see it. So, you know, give it time. I will. Yeah. Uh, Robbo says, I'm hyped at the news that Saw 11 is being greenlit, but just hope that it carries on the high benchmark and emotional beats of uh, 10 rather than go back to diminishing returns. The whole franchise is a guilty pleasure, but when done right, it's a damn good entertainment. I mean, it is. It, Saw 10 is kind of fun, I guess. I liked I it. Didn't, yeah, I did not hate Saw 10. It's a bit goofy. I don't. I, I didn't really feel like I needed to see more Saw movies. I feel like ten films is probably <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah. This concept. Yeah, just, the ten, the first ten make chapter one of ten. Okay, so there's gonna be plenty to go. <laughs> I love the idea. Like we'll all be like old men just sitting here, like yeah. So <laughs> Saw seventy five. Eh? <laughs> Those who don't know, there is a video out there if you search for it of uh, me and Drinker watching it with some friends. The whole movie. You can there find is, it. Out yeah. there. We had a lot of good fun watching that one. Yeah. Can I quickly um, read a uh, comment out? Yeah. Go for it. It just, it just is for Mitch. He says, I can't stand the robot head voice modulation. That's for you, <laughs> Mitch. I'll just give you a personal one there. Just sort of thought he'd like that. Are you, are you <laughs> modulating your voice? Are you actually not Australian? <laughs> 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 There's no such thing as Australians. Of course, he's modulating. His yeah, voice. turns out your, his like real voice is real squeaky, and he has it modulated Batman style. Oh, guys, <laughs> and I'm a woman. It's a made up. <laughs> Australian is made up nationality, like Welsh. <laughs> no, we're not made up. We're just horrifying and live in caves. That's different. Yes. <laughs> One sympathizes when you live in Scotland. <laughs> um, I'll do a couple more. Uh, Copus Joubert says God of War uh, really is one of the best franchises ever. I'm not, gonna... um, depends on what your metric is, I suppose. Um, but it's doing incredibly well to the point where if they spend another four or five years to make the Egypt Kratos game, that could make shit tons of money. Um, yeah. and at this point, they could probably expand it with maybe some spin offs like Atreus or Freya, whoever the fuck they want. But yes, God of War is surprising. It started out what in 2005. And its uh, its low point was uh, ascension. I'm saying this as if any of you guys have any fucking clue what I'm talking about. It's okay, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> God of War is a neat <laughs> series of games. That's all. The only reason I know anything about God of War is because every couple of years my brother gets very excited about it and tries to like yeah. tell me every little thing about it, which I promptly forget. It's oh, definitely so gotten better in, since the since the soft reboot that they did. To uh to clarify by the way, I didn't mean low point as in Ascension is like a bad game. I was actually kind of happy with it. I just meant low point in terms of engagement. I think Ascension didn't do very well. That's all. So then they they did yeah. the reboot. Uh, 
Jordan Pendragon says, I watched your review of It's a Wonderful Life after seeing the film for the zillionth time for Christmas. An absolute gem of a film and a great review. Cheers. Thank you. And uh, yeah, one of the very few movies that can reliably bring a little lump to my throat when I watch it. Um, oh. Yeah. Best I, Christmas I consider film. it, it's the Christmas film to beat, mm. I would say. Mm. Um, Normie says, greetings all. Since it's the holiday season, what's everyone's top three Chris, uh, sorry, favorite Christmas movies of all time? Die Hard. Yep. Jingle all the no way. Argument. <laughs> Jingle all the way. <laughs> Fuck off. I love that movie. How dare you? <laughs> Home Alone. Um, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. It's a Wonderful Life and Home Alone. I think uh, Home Alone. No, sorry. Um, it's a Wonderful Life. It's going to have to be very hard. I hate to say it, but it's so good. Um, and Muppets Christmas Carol. Perfect film. <laughs> Perfect rendition of the Dickens classic. <laughs> solid, solid answers. I still uh, like so Elf. Me... Elf. Yeah, I do like. Yeah, it's pretty good. Thrill. Pretty good. And movie. I was, I was, I, I spent my whole life not thinking Die Hard was a Christmas movie, and then that was changed last year when someone did point out that he straps the gun to his back with Christmas sticky tape. And there you go. <laughs> That so, completely that changed, changed your mind. My whole opinion. It did. It did. So I've gone from whole life, not a Christmas movie, to yes, it is a Christmas movie. <laughs> it, there's enough things added up. It was the final domino that convinced me, the final point that got me across the line. Yeah, it says ho 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 as well. Now I have a machine gun. Ho <laughs> ho ho. <laughs> John McLaren. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll do one more here. Samson the Mighty says, Drinker and panel on Saturday Night Live, Adam Driver said while playing the piano, I didn't kill Han Solo. Wokeness killed Han Solo. Is he trying to apologize to us or for the decisions of the Disney trilogy? What are your thoughts? I, think I, I haven't plain. seen the clip, but I assume it's like self-aware cringe comedy sort of thing. Or it probably is, yeah. Because you know, as for who killed Han Solo, I think I was talking about this on Real BBC, but it's like that would be Harrison Ford killed Han Solo. He was uh, famously ready for the character to die for a very, very long time. Disney probably would have squeezed him for a bit longer than the one movie if they could have. But then again, they fucking kill everybody, so who do I... Yeah, and they sort of brought, brought him back as like an imaginary force ghost like figment of uh, Kylo's imagination for the final movie. So, yeah, you can always, you can always do things with people if you throw enough money at them. The guys here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's such a weird scene that everyone just glosses over that he just reappears like a force ghost. It's like, yep. yeah, we're just going <laughs> with that. Uh, did did yeah. someone ask Harrison Ford? Is like, it was so was he a force ghost or was he like a figment, a figment of his imagination? And did did he not just say like, what the fuck is a force ghost? <laughs> <laughs> Give me the fuck alone. <laughs> <laughs> just Get one cameo. Lawn. Cameo. Like, I'm not on your lawn. <laughs> Uh, but uh, well I'll probably finish up there for tonight actually um, well, I, I want to say first of all thank you for everyone who sent all these extremely generous super chats in um, we haven't got through all of them tonight because we never can there's just too many damn it uh, but we will absolutely catch up with them as we always do Mulver and I um, mm. and thank you to everyone who's come in for the for the chat in general and thank you to the mods for keeping everything ticking over and most of all, thank you to my guests for joining me for Open Bar for a couple of hours. It's been awesome to have you guys on. I very much appreciate it. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. It's weird getting drunk at this time of the morning, but I'll keep pushing <laughs> yeah. it. I say just embrace it. Yeah, yeah you're going to have a fun day. Uh, yeah. Live your like truth, robot. First you think it's weird, and then you come to get used to it, and then you need it. <laughs> and then you're me. Yeah, pretending um, it's not a normal daily thing. Yeah, I mean, you're Australian. Come on, you know about getting drunk. It's all right. No, we just established it was a lie. It was a voice thing. He's <laughs> like voice us. modulator. You actually she live in like woman. Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> I do like, I get a lot of you British pricks think you know everything, which always makes me laugh in the comments. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we do know everything, yeah. though. Just clarifying. Well, yeah. yeah that's why we. I'm Australian. I know nothing. That's why we always get cast as villains. You see, we've got that air of authority to us. We know mm. the truth that the world should burn. Yeah. 
but yeah, um, I guess before we go, is there anything you guys have got coming up you want to make the panel or, or you want to make the chat aware of? Anything that you're working on right now? We should know. Sure, I I'll do. go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. No, no, no. You first. You're the guest. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you're just um, a filthy co-host, Mueller. You shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you stay quiet now. <laughs> um, oh, well. Well, one well, quick thing before I, I tell you what I'm going to work on. Mahler, I saw BBC, the BBC, the real BBC that you did earlier this week, and you've convinced me to watch Angel and Buffy, which I've never watched. Yay. So I'm going I'm to do that. I'm really excited about it. Another um, victim. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll give you like an episode by episode breakdown by a text. I hope you don't mind. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going, I'm currently working on a video that's actually, um, I'm, going through all the feminist waves for second, third, and fourth to try to understand the feminist impact on women today and if women are actually happy. So that's a video probably going to drop in the new year um, first week. Look out for it then. Baggage claim, you should try and pick the moment they should have stopped. Like the moment they should have stopped in 1978 and that day they went past that, it was all downhill. <laughs> I like actually, the, yeah, the, the gains versus like the cost, like yeah, that's where it just like reaches its apex. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's a like, lever that has feminism on it. They turn it to off. It's like we did it. <laughs> it's done. Yeah, and it's funny because like it's gone so far that then there are all these women now who want to go back to zero and say like we shouldn't have the right to vote. We shouldn't have the right to divorce. Like there's every yeah. they want to like pull everything, every every right we've ever asked for and argued for. They want to pull all of that back. Some of the women are saying maybe this whole women thing was a mistake. It's gotten crazy. <laughs> we should just ban women and make them illegal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and make men the new women, you know. Yeah. 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 Just to make up for the... Something that's actually happening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> women of the year is like a man. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, Rose is the best yeah. of us. Yeah. Uh, Mora, did you say you had something? Well, it is it is a big old something. It is the uh, the EFAP movies Lord of the Rings extended trilogy watch Ooh. through, and this is a little bit more special than usual because it's got intense levels of editing, and it's going to be a, just about seven to eight hours long as a video. It goes through the entire trilogy, and this time we talk rather seriously, at least somewhat, about uh you know why the trilogy is so good, and going scene by scene and watching it and commentating and stuff, and. Our guests as well, of course, for it. It's to celebrate Lord of the Rings being out for 20 whole years. A, I don't know, a touchstone of just how incredible cinema could be if uh, we could push it to its heights. Most people seem to like those films, so we're looking forward to getting it done. And as soon as we're out today, I'm going to go and finish editing it, hopefully by Saturday. That's that's the hopes. It would start Saturday, 6 p.m. Uh, GMT. Yeah, because we're in, not in summertime. So be there. Or B square. <laughs> it's also got me in it, so it's got intense levels of stupidity. So I should oh, warn yeah. you for that one. The biggest shock is that it's only seven hours. I was gonna say you'd think like how did that happen? And it's like, well, we chopped out all of the bad jokes. So <laughs> you know, it went down significantly. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that or the videos wouldn't exist. So Wait, it's also not the extended jokes. version. I did say extended, right? It's the extended, don't you worry. All of the yeah. Best of scenes that Peter Jackson had to cut out are in there. Good Not stuff. Tom, Tom Bombadil, though. He didn't make it. We'll never see him represented oh, faithfully on screen. So we talk about him, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, well, anyway, thank you guys for coming on. It's been awesome to have you all on. Um, and appreciate it. And, well, we will catch you at the next open bar. But that is all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye. Bye. Cheers.